What's going on? Coding Garden Fan, good to see you in chat. How's it going? How was your weekend? Doing anything fun? turn down there we go i used to have so i use a i use a stream deck for my stream and i've got a button on here that says like go play this song um and the the intro music that you hear is a song called believe the hype um and it's a single artist uh who goes by the name of slipstream without any vowels and um so i found i found this track and it was free as part of the stream deck and so every time i hit the button it would start playing that intro music uh which usually works really well but for some reason, uh, my Windows PC doesn't always play that sound. And so it turns out they've also got the track on Spotify. And uh, on Spotify, that's where I, I stream the background music. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make like a playlist for the intro and then, you know, pick one of these other uh, playlists to play in the background. But I have to remember to like slide the volume up so people can actually hear the intro music. But then I got to remember to turn it back down later on because not everybody wants their eardrums blasted with the... Uh, EDM music or, or anything. <laughs> so apologies for that. Thanks for the reminder to turn that back down. Um, so yeah, so I gave away like a whole bunch of those. Uh, Van Radius, good to see you in chat. Um, Van Radius, you also missed the uh, the giveaway. Um, the fun thing was um, only 12 people entered and I had 12 dragons to give away. So I got to play Oprah. Said, you get a dragon, you get a dragon, you get a dragon, everybody gets a dragon. Uh, and so I've got a stack of boxes uh, over here. And I'm going to take them to the post office in the morning and get those mailed out. Uh, I just got to get everybody's addresses and, and stuff. So hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody got me their address. I got to check all my uh, whispers and such on Twitch. So yeah, everybody got uh, one of these articulated dragons that you see printing on the on the screen up here at the top. Uh, but it's basically this model of this dragon, and this is a really cool like burgundy silver uh, blend. And uh, so yeah, so I basically just printed, like I've been mass producing these things like like mad over here. Um, and there's actually a stack of them right here on the desk, uh, but they're all being sent to family. Um, so yeah, so I had that giveaway on Thursday. Sorry you missed it. We, uh, so I had my friend Josh, uh, who I worked with at SendGrid, had him on the stream and he has a really long history in HR. So go check out that video. And basically all we did for two hours is we kind of rapid fired like Let's look at a resume. He would kind of give his impression as an HR rep. Like, what does he like about it? Would he pass it on to me as an engineering manager? And then w do I like the resume? And so it was a lot of back and forth on, okay, well, this is what we liked. And this is what seemed a little off or like, oh yeah, look how long it took us to find that information. This is why you're getting passed on uh, with these resumes. And so it was a really good talk. It was, it was a solid two hours long. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some of the resumes that were sent to me were sent as like, oh, here's a resume I don't care about anymore. Um, and I, I promptly deleted those emails. And so I don't remember which of those resumes were sent to me legitimately wanting a resume review and who was actually asking for um, like just like given, giving me like a sample resume. Um, but I can recover the emails. So thankfully, I got like three weeks or whatever from Gmail to, uh, to recover those. So... Um, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to find those. And then everybody that sent me a resume and they legit want a resume review, 
um, I will definitely do those on the stream. So speaking of, what do you want me to do on the stream tonight? I've got a couple of questions. I've really only got like two really solid thought out questions uh, that I'd love to dive into, but I can also pick up some of these resumes and, and do quick resume reviews. Um, I'm happy to just chat about how folks are doing in, uh, in live chat. Um, and also kind of want to talk a little bit about my own job hunt and how I'm trying to stay optimistic about things. I think it's important that even this time of year when things, you know, the process tends to slow down a little bit. I think it's important that, uh, you know, we, we give these companies enough latitude of like, okay, you know, it's the holidays. We just got past the holiday. Everybody's like getting ready for the next holiday. But that doesn't necessarily mean that their hiring practice has to slow down, but it will be a little bit more difficult to try to figure out, you know, hey, when can we squeeze in some more interviews? When can we do these last rounds? Um, and so I do want to chat a little bit about just some thoughts that I've had about how I'm trying to stay optimistic. Uh, to be honest, it was pretty hard today. I was I was beating myself up most of the day. But uh, yeah, you're just waiting for the year to end. Yeah, I hear that. <laughs> Talk about my job hunt. Okay, so we'll start with that. Um, and then let's see what else. I'm definitely going to get into some live coding this week um, and maybe some uh, some of the Amazon Cloud Practitioner, like the AWS Cloud Practitioner uh, certification. So I think I'm going to uh, start diving in on some of that. And so it's just going to be like a lot of learning material and going through like the prastic, prastic practice exam uh, that they have for that. And uh, I'm going to try to schedule that for January. So. What companies am I interviewing with? There's one company I will not name uh, because I really, really, really want a job with them and I don't want to jinx it. So I will name everybody else. <laughs> um, how's that? I don't want to jinx it. I, I really want to work with this team. This team is outstanding. They're all really quality people. Um, I have a ton of respect for many of them on the team and, and the ones I don't have respect for, I just haven't met yet. To be honest, everybody that I've met is like outstanding people. Um, and, and I would absolutely work and collaborate with every single one of them that I've met. They're just amazing people. Um, I am interviewing at Twilio. So I did my, I did my last, I did my second last interview with Twilio, uh, on Friday, but I messed up. I messed up and I need to own this because when I realized I messed up, I was blaming the recruiter, thinking the recruiter gave me bad instructions. Um, the instructions that I had was it was a 45 minute call and I had to come up with a technical presentation where I was doing live coding. And so I, I basically uh, prepared a 45 minute live coding demonstration of the Python script that you've heard me talk about, where on these Q&A things, I basically slice up the, uh, the videos into the little shorts that I've been putting on YouTube. And then using those, uh, those extracted pieces and extracting the audio from that, putting intros and outros on those and producing the podcast. And I know that the podcast episodes have run out just in time for Apple to go, oh, hey, by the way, we picked up your podcast. So it's now on Apple Podcasts. Um, and so if you're checking that out, um, please leave a review. Let me know what you think of it. Um, five stars would be awesome. Um, but if you've got like an iDevice of any sort, if you can pull up Apple Podcasts and just search for Tech Interview Guide Podcast, um, follow it, give it a, give it a good review. Like I'm here to help people out. And so I'm, I, I just, I need it to get noticed so that other people can listen to it. Um, so if you could help me out with that, that'd be a huge help. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube later on, uh, you can also do that. I'll try to put a link down in the description. And since you're here, like, and subscribe all the marketing blitzy stuff that I'm bad at. Um, tell your friends to come by and watch videos and like them and subscribe and such. Um, and so I messed up. I messed up this interview in a bad way. And I felt really, really down about it Friday afternoon. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I messed that up because the recruiter told me it was a 45 minute call. Well, they had sent me an email like two weeks ago saying, prepare a 20 minute technical presentation where you do some live code. And it can't be about Twilio. It has to be just a coding project, like something that you've been working on. And I'm like, I got just the thing. I've been working on this. I've been updating it. I'm like ready to, ready to go for it. And, uh, and so we start the call on Friday and they're like, all right, well, we're going to hand it over to you. Like, it was just real quick intros of like, here's everybody on the call. I'm like, cool. And just to clarify, it's a 45 minute presentation. They're like, no, it's a 45 minute call. It's a 20 minute presentation. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> In the back of my mind, I'm like, oh crap, what have I done? Cause I was going to like hand code this whole thing. 
Well, thankfully, the way that I position my screens, I've got these two big monitors kind of a little bit off center. This, this one's right in front of me, and then this one's like next to it. And then over on this side, I've got a laptop. But the way that I had planned to do it was I had my presentation and my notes right here. So as I'm reading the presentation, it looks like I'm looking at you, but I'm really just reading the notes. Um, it's, it's a little engagement trick that you can do. And um, off to the side of like the edge of my big monitor right in front of me on the, on the very left edge is where I was gonna live code because on the right edge of the monitor next to it was my actual working code. And so I could just kind of glance at that and write that line of code, glance, write a line of code, glance, write a line of code and explain what I had written in comments as I went. So it looked super polished. Presentation trick for you. If you're ever doing it remote, super easy to do that way so anyway uh i basically i'm like i don't have time to live code this anymore so i had to kind of switch gears i'm like okay well i'm going to talk about how i use ffmpeg and i went through a couple of slides just describing the problem and, and the space and and the general steps of what i was going to do and when i got over to the code i'm like i messed up i thought i was going to have 45 minutes for this and so for the sake of brevity just for the, this presentation i'm just going to copy and paste some code that i've already got ready to go and basically I would copy and paste a chunk of code and then I would explain it. And then I copy and paste a chunk of code and explain it, copy and, and explain it. And uh, the way that I, I like to write code is I like to do sort of error condition handling, not so much like exception handling in Python, but just like, hey, if, if this temporary file already exists, don't go extract that video again, just move on to the next part. And the next part was sandwich the intro and the outro to make it YouTube ready. And then the part after that was go grab just the audio for, um, uh, for the podcast. And so I, I did the first part of just, okay, just go extract the video. And then I actually showed them in, in the terminal how I was running it and it was like running through the thing. And while that was running, I went back and I explained a little bit more about the code and some of the, um, some of the uh, switches and stuff on the, on the parameters and for the library calls. And then when it, when it finished that part, I'm like, cool, now let's go like look okay well these files are like 25 megs each and if we go into the file explorer we can you know see that they're a minute and a half long extractions which is what i'd planned for and i said now i'm just going to paste in this other code and i'll explain how i'm sandwiching these things together and how it has to like put all the video streams together all the audio streams together and merge it down into one video stream one audio stream and merge all of that through a render node into the final like sandwiched video and then I explained that at a really high level and then I ran that code. And then while that was running, I went back and I explained a little bit more. And so that one actually processes decently fast where it's sandwiching everything. Cause I got like big beefy rig over here with uh, like an NVIDIA 3090, way overspent <laughs> buying that thing, but totally worth it because it went really fast, like ripping all the stuff and encoding and decoding and whatever. Um, and so it finished and then I actually like pulled it up on the screen and I showed them, this was the extracted video. And, and the point of the video, of course, I'm just putting in like random durations and, and so on. And it was a part where I'm like rubbing my nose like this. And I was talking about my four mailing lists. And I'm like, okay, well, there's the video where you see me rubbing my nose. And I'm holding up four fingers. And then I showed them the, the, the one with the YouTube intro and outro. And I kind of skipped through the intro and then cut over to the video of me like rubbing my nose and holding up four fingers. And so they could see that it was like legitimately sandwiched together and so on. And then they did some Q&A at the end. And the first question they asked is like, if you had to do this again, what would you do differently? And I'm like, I would pay attention to my time constraints. <laughs> but it was a really good discussion. Like the, there were four people on the call and all four of them were very professional and amazing. Two of them, I think were at a conference and they made time out of their day at a conference to like come and interview me. So I'm like, I'm so grateful. Thank you for spending your time. Um, and then I sent them all LinkedIn uh, connection requests over the weekend and uh, told them, you know, hey, I appreciate the time that you took on Friday, looking forward to next steps and, and hearing some feedback. So that's my way of sending uh, a little like follow up, like note of gratitude to people is I tend to send them LinkedIn uh, connection requests. Just, hey, I had a really good conversation. I'd like to stay connected if you're open to that. And uh, in my experience, most people are, are pretty OK with it. Um, as of tonight, not a single one of the four have accepted that connection request. Um, but one of them did follow me on Twitch. So there's that. Um, and, uh, he also, uh, he also live streams here on Twitch too. So, um, so yeah, so it was, it was pretty interesting to, uh, to see that. And then let's see what else. Oh, Friday. I also had my follow-up call with Amazon. 
about the loop interview. And the loop interview is basically the very last stage where you're doing like four or five hours of, well, they told me it was four or five hours and that it would be four or five people in 45 minute uh, like behavioral questions where it's all around their leadership principles. Um, and so they've got all these documented leadership principles. And basically you just have to answer these behavioral questions about why you're gonna be amazing at Amazon. And I've got a couple of friends that work or have worked at Amazon. Um, and I basically wrote down just tons of notes from them about things to keep in mind and how to answer certain kinds of questions. And like every single one of them was like, use the star method. I'm like, I'm well versed with the star method. That's not a problem. The problem is how do I come up with examples? Cause I've got 25 years of experience. I've, I've got plenty of stories to tell. I mean, anybody that's hung out any period of time on, on my stream knows I go off on tangents and tell stories. The problem that I heard from one of them and, and this, this individual actually recently left Amazon and they were an interviewer doing the loop interviews at Amazon. And so this person was like the ideal person to connect with to like give me the lowdown on like, this is what they're really listening for. This is what they really want. And I'm like, this is like gold nugget. Like all of this information is great. Um, and one of his things was telling me like, yeah, and they also expect the stories to be recent, like within the last three or four years. I'm like, oh crap. Three or four years ago i was an instructor and you know the last six months i was a director of engineering learning at stream and i don't like that's only two jobs like how am i going to tell stories if i can only rely on the last two jobs and they're like well you can talk about like previous jobs if you want but don't say like oh yeah 15 years ago i did the thing you can just say oh yeah at one company that i worked at this is the situation that happened and don't put time frames on it i'm like all right it's good advice. It's good to know. So when you're getting ready for those kinds of interviews, having that networking, I can't, I can't say enough about how important networking is in your job hunt. Even if it's just to circle back and say, Hey, I got this interview coming up. I'm a little bit nervous about it. I'm not asking you to give me the questions that they're going to give me because they, they typically can't or won't. And, and I would never expect anybody to, um, but just, you know, can you give me some general advice on like how I should approach some of this? I reached out to three people. Um, one of them currently works there and the other two have left within the last, I want to say six months to a year, six months maybe. Um, but they're like, it was really fresh in their mind, like what their interview process was and, and how they, well, one of, one of those three actually did interviews. And so it was just amazing just to circle back with all them going, I'm nervous about this. Like I could really see myself in this job being an AWS instructor. And so it would be me teaching the AWS certification classes, which would be pretty great. Um, my whole, my whole background has been, I'm going to go learn something and I'm going to teach it to you. And then I'm going to watch you go do something cool. And oftentimes in my life, I find more excitement over the fact that, hey, I just taught Van Radius something and now Van Radius is going doing something cool. Look what Van Radius can do now. And like hyping you up and like, look what you can do more so than the fact that I learned it myself and was able to teach it to you. Um, like, I mean, one of the first professional examples of that is uh, I taught a, a friend of mine in Los Angeles. I taught him PHP programming. He went to business school and graduated and you know, was like this hard, like really like ready to jump into entrepreneurship, like really classy guy, had a billion ideas and every one of them was like moneymaker. And uh, he's like, I want to learn to code. I'm like, cool, let me, let me get you into some code. So I taught him some basics. I taught him some fundamentals. I taught him PHP syntax. Next thing I know, the guy gets a job at Yahoo. And I'm like, well, if I taught this guy and he got a job at Yahoo, I should be able to get a job at Yahoo. So I went and I interviewed at Yahoo and I didn't get hired. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that, that, that hurt. Um, but it is what it is. Anyway, but it's nice to be able to circle back to people and just say, hey, like I could really use some help. And just being really vulnerable with them and say, I'm nervous about this. I could really see myself in that job. And, uh, and so all three of them are like, what do you need? Like, how much time do you need? Just call me. And so I did phone calls with all of them last week uh, leading up to Friday, but Friday was just the prep call. And so it was just like, Hey, let's talk about like, just make sure that you're kind of, you're going to be interviewing at this level, uh, which is lower than I would have liked, but you know, I don't have any AWS certifications. If I did, I probably would have gotten in at that more senior level. 
Um, but one of their leadership principles is how do you take initiative? And so that's me this week going through the AWS architecture uh, or like cloud practitioner certification and scheduling that exam so that when I, if I get a question like that on Friday, like tell us about a time you took initiative. I'm like, I'm gonna need the AWS certification for this job. And so I'm already in the process of doing that. So I'm gonna hit the ground running even faster, you know, if I get the job. Hopefully things like that are gonna win them over because they want very specific details. They want, they want like very data heavy kinds of answers um, and also like recent answers. So Friday, I somehow ended up with these three big interviews. Well, the, the Amazon one wasn't so much an interview, it was more just a check-in kind of thing. Um, but it still felt really important because I also thought that they were gonna be doing the salary negotiation on that call. That one's gonna be Tuesday. So Tuesday is when I get to really crack my knuckles and, and flex the negotiation uh, skills that I've been coaching people on over the, over the years. I was like, all right, let's put this in practice myself. And it's, it's hard, y'all. It's, it's so much easier being on this side of the microphone and just spouting advice and spouting perspective. It's much harder when you're the one in, in, the, uh, in the field doing it. But, uh, but I've been able to negotiate so far and I've been able to negotiate with uh, a couple of groups to speed things up, which has been really nice. And so when I get to Tuesday and it comes to the negotiation, like I'm going to be ready for it. Um, I know what I'm worth. I know what they're offering for the role. I know what the different level like salary bands are. And they said, you're coming in at a super strong L5. Well, a friend of mine got a job as an L5. And when he got promoted to L6, he actually ended up with a pay cut because when they promote you, they start you at the bottom of that band. And he was already at the top of L5. And so I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's good to know. And then a couple of the others are like, negotiate as much salary as you can and then negotiate the heck out of those RSUs. Because the first year you only get 5% of the RSUs, the second year you get 15% and the next two years you get 40%. Most tech firms, when they give you equity or RSUs, they do 25% every year. But Amazon has such a high attrition rate in the first year or two, they lower that equity. And so the equity that you get or that vests is only 5% the first year, 15% the second year, and then 40% years three and four, which is kind of unfortunate. And so my one friend said, negotiate for as much as possible, because then if you only stay a year, you can at least max that out as much as you can. So interesting stuff like that to, uh, to kind of think about. So that's Tuesday. So and then Tuesday, supposedly, I have a system design interview with uh, a startup. Um, and actually, I'll share that name. It's interviewing.io. They want to uh, hire me for an engineering role. Well, they want me to uh, interview for an engineering role. And um, and so I'm super excited about that. I've been on the platform for four years. I know the founder, get along great with the founder. Uh, one of the, their lead engineer I actually worked with uh, several years ago at Stream, uh, super classy person. Um, and and they're, all, they're all fantastic. Like they're, they're trying to change what interviewing is all about. They're trying to make the job hunt easier for all of us. Like go to their platform, get vetted, and then the companies that trust their vetting process, they're going to fast track you through their interview process. That's basically the idea of their platform. And I'm like, I can get on board with anybody that's going to make interviewing better for everybody. Like, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think it's going to be great. So, um, so yeah, so I'm pretty, pretty stoked about that. Um, just going back in chat. Chris L. Jarvis, good to have you in chat. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's a good point. Prove you're working to a goal. Yeah, that's exactly it. They want to know that you're taking initiative and that's a perfect example of like, all right, I've already started the process of getting that first certification because I don't have any and I know that that's going to be part of the job anyway. So the AWS instructor role, basically how that works is the first three weeks of the month, you're doing instruction for some amount of that week and it could be anywhere from one day to three days. And then the rest of the time that you're not actually teaching a class, you're, you're taking a class to work towards the next certifications. And when you're comfortable enough with that content, you get to teach that content for other people to go get that certification. I'm like, that's like my dream job right there. Like go learn a thing and then teach other people. I'm like, that's me, pick me, pick me. That's exactly like, that's my whole life um, is, is like, how can I learn something and then like teach that to someone else? Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I've heard a lot of bad things about Amazon. It's a very internally competitive uh, kind of role. But at the same time, the AWS team, like collectively, like the entire AWS side of the org, they're building so much stuff. Like there's so many new things that there's no shortage of avenues that I could get into. And there's no directed path of like, 
you're going to teach this and then you're going to teach this and then you're going to teach this. It's like you're going to start teaching like introduction to cloud and like intro to AWS. And then whatever certifications you get after that is my choice. And then as I get those certifications, I get to teach those classes. So it's the things that I'm super passionate about. I'm like, great. Uh, but their catalog is gigantic. I'm like, they got like 200, over 200 services now uh, as part of AWS. It's like, where do you even start? Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited to kind of dive into that catalog this week. And so the live coding that you see in the, on the prompt down here below my picture, the live coding that I'm going to be getting into during the week this week is getting into some of the cloud practitioner stuff to prep for that exam. Um, but also just examining like, what kind of career paths do I want to have? Like, how do I want to build this up going forward? And what do I want to be able to teach? What do I already kind of know that I can just go learn the AWS way of doing it and then go teach that? Um, and so I'm pretty, uh, pretty stoked about that. Uh, what else we got in chat? So some, uh, Steven asking about resume reviews. So yeah, there's a, a URL that you can, uh, upload a resume review or, uh, upload a resume to me. I do ask, like, try to anonymize your name, phone number, and email address. I don't like to dox people on the internet. Um, and so if you are going to email me over a resume, just anonymize those details. And then I'll do a live resume review here on the stream. So if you want me to do some tonight, um, send over some emails and, uh, I'll, I'll get on a couple of resume reviews tonight. Um, Stephen Hungry says, I got rejected by Google. Oh, you got asked a hard DP problem. Oh, that sucks. Um, yeah, DP, not a fan of DP, to be honest. I mean, really, there are so many better ways of doing problems than using dynamic programming. Um, and like building up this enormous data set and then maybe find what you're looking for in there. I think it's better just to start with what you're looking for and work backwards. And, and that way you're only building up enough memory for what you actually need. Um, and, and Facebook and Amazon actually announced this summer and this fall that they're not even asking DP problems anymore. They're like, we're not getting good data. We're not getting good signals from people. So they're just not asking DP anymore. And I think it, it, it won't take a very long time, but I think we'll start to see that kind of trickle out into the industry as well. Like other, everybody wants to be like Fang. And so they're gonna look at the kinds of questions that they ask and go, yeah, we don't wanna ask those either. Um, and it's happened in the past. Like Google used to ask those ridiculous, like how many golf balls fit in an airplane kind of questions. Everyone's like, those are amazing questions. We're going to ask them too. And then like three years in, Google's like, nah. And everyone else is like, yeah, we're not going to ask those either. Those are dumb. Um, so yeah. So I, I imagine it'll be, it'll be a matter of time before everybody stops or, or reduces the amount of DP problems. But, uh, yeah, sorry to hear that, Steven. I know you were looking forward to that interview. Required knowing something called Bell's Numbers. I have no idea what that is either. Uh, Bell's Numbers? What the heck is Bell's Numbers? Bell's Numbers. Combinatorial math. Count the possible partitions of a set. These numbers have been studied by, by mathematicians since the 19th century. And their roots go back to medieval Japan. See, I hate interviews where you have to memorize like trivial crap that you're not even going to use on the job. Like my first question, like if, if the interviewer came and like, well, you should have known, you know, whatever this Bell's numbers thing. I'm like, okay, can you describe to me how that's used on the job? Like legitimately, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, you know, a jerk about it, but like, can you explain how that's used on the job? Because I could see like, if it's part of the job, absolutely. It's fair game. If it's not part of the job, like, can I have a different interview question that's actually relevant to the work I'm going to do here, please? That's, that's like my biggest beef about these leak code problems on the internet. And I, I hate to go off on like tangent and hop up back on my soapbox every single time, but I get riled up by this. It's dumb. And, and I've sat through my own interviews over the past month. Like I've been interviewing for the past month um, with different companies and I've, I've faced the same thing. They're like, oh, well, you should know this like really obscure like math formula. It's like, no, I shouldn't. Like you don't even do like GIS positioning for latitude and longitude at the company. Why are you giving me a leak code challenge that has to do with that? Like if you want to give me a heat problem, there are heat problems that are going to be more relevant to the, the, you know, the business of what you do as a company. I've researched your company. I know what your company does. I know your tech stack. You don't do anything about GIS. So why are you giving me this question? Uh, it's like, it's, it's the worst thing. Like it's, it's so dumb. It's so dumb for, for companies to just, you know, oh, I'm just going to go grab some rando, you know, problem off a of leak code and good luck. <laughs> uh, that stinks. 
uh, Van Radio says, I'd rather do DP problems than string manipulation. Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty good at string manipulation. Um, who in their profession uses low-level string manipulation? Maybe a very small minority. I mean, in my whole career, in my 25-year career, I have built one, exactly one, try or prefix tree, uh, like an autocomplete kind of thing. I built it once in my entire career. I was doing some uh, consulting work for a marketing company that worked for Toyota. And Toyota basically gave me two CSV files of a million customers with full street address uh, information, and they wanted me to deduplicate it. And so I had to deduplicate it based on the street address. Well, street addresses suck. <laughs> you think time zones are bad. You think dealing with time zones and time date conversions is bad. Try, try street addresses. They are garbage. It's like 123 North Main Street Southwest is not necessarily the same as 123 Main Street, but it might be in a small enough town. And so like, how do you extract all these different pieces and then put weight on like, well, if it's got like a direction before the street, like, so I, I wrote the code and uh, like just doing like a one for one, it was, it was an N squared comparison basically. So a million times a million, I'm doing a trillion operations of like for each row, compare a million rows and then that next row compare a million rows the next one compare a million rows it was it was going to take something like 45 days to run and so they called me that afternoon they're like hey can we get a status update on uh, how long that's going to take i'm like yeah it should be ready by like mid-july and they're like we need it like next week for a marketing campaign that we're doing i'm like you're asking me to deduplicate a million records against another million records in a week and so I switched to using a prefix tree and it crunched in about 48 hours, but it still took a really long time, but it did, it did really optimize it. And I found a lot of duplication and, and that was the right path. But I've done that once in my career, my entire career, I've implemented recursion twice in production. I can't tell you how many times I've done recursion as an interview problem. I've used it twice on the job. Like anyway. Going back to chat, um, Stephen Hungry says, the other problems were pretty good. This one interviewer showed up late and I, and said I complicated things, weird. Um, if he gave me the five minutes he was late for, I could have given an optimal answer. Yeah, that stinks. Um, I don't like knowing algorithms like KMP, Robin Karp, Boy or More. I don't know what those are. Those are words. I've been doing this 25 years. I have no idea what any of those three algorithms are that you just mentioned, Van Radius. No clue. And it sucks that we have to go learn that stuff. We have to practice and jump through all these hoops to spend like hours and you know in an interview process and then get told yes or no. And then, okay, you can forget all that knowledge now. You're never ever gonna need it again. Feels a lot like college. You spent hours and hours and months and weeks learning and studying to sit through an exam. You graduate and then you never use that knowledge ever again. Uh, Van Radius says, I was ex expected to know KMP or Rabin Carp during an Amazon interview. I gave the recruiter how it was a bad problem to ask and it doesn't help knowing the candidate. <laughs> I bet you got that job, huh? Um, yeah, interviewers aren't, aren't uh, real fans of being told that their problem is garbage. Um, Stephen Hunger says, how do I get a job or how do I get an interview at Meta? Step one is apply. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Tried to hydrate and I inhaled half of it. <coughs> um, getting a job at Meta slash Facebook is going to feel a lot like the other fan companies, to be honest. They're going to ask a lot of uh, algorithm type stuff as well. Um, but they also have a new step that's been introduced that I've been hearing about for the past month, month and a half that you go through like the algorithm stage, you write some code like in a live on site, you do a product uh, or you do a system design interview. But now they have something they call a product design interview where you're interacting with a product team apparently and like how would you prioritize like features to work on and stuff like that. I don't know all the ins and outs, but, uh, but apparently there's this new style of interview called a product design, which is now part of their process. So. Ben Radius got the Amazon offer and rejected it. Cool. All right. Good for you. Um, reach out to recruiters. Yeah. Cold email message folks on LinkedIn. 
Um, you know what's interesting? I actually, as part of this whole job hunt, I actually applied for five jobs at Microsoft. And they were all like technical writing, developer advocate, you know, technical trainer. And within like 48 hours, I got an automated rejection for all of them. I'm like, really? I've been an instructor. I've been doing technical writing for 20 years. I've, you know, I live stream. I've got all this content. Apparently not good enough for Microsoft. So, well, um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I had a recruiter on um, my connected LinkedIn, sent two messages and he didn't respond. Recruiters are also pretty busy. I mean, it's not like they're like, nah, I don't care about Steven. I'm not going to get back to him. Um, recruiters are just busy all the time. I would say any any way that you can connect with them and say like, hey, can we hop on a call? They're probably going to appreciate like the live, you know, interaction there. Um, product design interview sounds cool. Yeah, I agree. It's, it, it's going to be interesting to hear people's stories about like what that part of the interview was so that we can all learn a little bit more about it. So as I learn more about it, I'm going to share that with all of you. Um, all I know is it's a new portion of, the, of their interview process um, where they want to focus on like how would you build part of a product or like how would you prioritize, you know, building out features or fixing bugs in a product, something along those lines. Um, so yeah, so we'll see how that... Uh, how that plays out over the next little while. And like I said, as I learn this stuff, I'm gonna be talking about it here on the stream because I'm all about sharing that knowledge as I learn it, so. Cool, cool. Hey, thanks for the uh, follow, this brown this brown man. Welcome to the stream. So I'm Ian, I'm the author of this website, techinterview.guide, and I'm just here to help people get better at tech interviews. I've been kind of ranting a little bit about my own job hunt lately uh, because I am fun employed as they call it. And <laughs> I. I was I was actually like feeling really down earlier today. Like I was I was feeling kind of defeated, um, but I kind of took some time and, and kind of reorganized my thoughts and thought, you know what? It's a new week. There's new opportunities, um, and so I got online and I applied for like I don't know eight or nine new jobs. And you know I'm I'm still hoping that like the three that I've got kind of going right before that I've got going right now, um, I'm hoping that one of those work out. Like I legit want one of those jobs. One of them I really, 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 really want. And I'm not naming them because I don't want to jinx it, but I really want that job. If I get that job, I'm going to be so happy um, because their, their whole team is amazing. Like every single person on the team that I've interacted with has been top notch, super professional, super fun. Um, and it's it's going to be like like really awesome to, uh, to work at that company. But I would absolutely take a job at Twilio. Um, interviewing IO, I would absolutely take a job um, and then Amazon, if I can get that AWS instructor role, like that would be sweet. I just, my worry about doing Amazon is that I may not be allowed to do live stream. I don't know. I might, but I mean, it's not, it's not like I'm live streaming the content of AWS. Um, cause it's completely different. Like I still want to talk about like interviewing and, and stuff like that in the job hunt and career development. Um, that's why I started this whole stream. But uh, I do know that Amazon is pretty particular about who can do public speaking, but I think it's public speaking about them. Like you can't give a talk on behalf of Amazon unless you go through like special public speaking training with Amazon, something like that. Uh, InstaFluff works for AWS. Oh, oh, and still streams? Oh, sweet, InstaFluff. Cool, I'm gonna go check out their channel and uh, give them a follow because I like, I like uh, seeing what other people are up to, so Twitch. TV Insta Fluff. Come and relax with Insta Fluff. I will follow Insta Fluff. GraphQL. Oh, I love GraphQL. GraphQL is amazing. Well, that's not amazing. It's great. <laughs> I won't call it amazing. It's it's pretty fun for sure. Um, this brown man asks in chat, hey, what's your honest opinion on the security field? Do you think it's gonna keep growing or are we gonna see an overabundance of unemployed sec engineers? I don't know a single unemployed like DevSecOps or SecOps InfoSec engineer. I don't know a single unemployed security engineer right now. Um, someone asked me a number of years ago uh, as part of like career development, like how, like how should I plan up my career? They actually asked, what are, what are, two, what are two fields that are always gonna have like job opportunities? And I said DevOps and security because how we deploy things, how we get them out there, how we make it scalable, highly available, re resilient, that's not going away. 
how we do like CI CD pipelines, that's not going away. How you're taking care of your servers, that's not going away. Everybody's gonna need a server to run something. It's just whether you have like uh, a cloud instance or whether you're doing serverless, which is just, you know, paying for, you know, even even more on-demand usage of just, hey, go run this function instead of, you know, keep the whole instance up and running. But when it comes to security, like that's always gonna be a thing. There are, there are a lot of companies and a lot of startups uh, in the field right now that are trying to kind of get in front of the cloud. So it's like, okay, well, you can go build your cloud architecture, but we're gonna sit in front of that as your security layer. Um, and so there are a lot of startups trying to get into that space. And those are companies that are hiring like crazy. Um, I heard from like three of them in the last four days while I was talking to people about my job hunt. They're like, you know, we're hiring and that's all they do is like cloud security. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for that right now. I think it's going to keep growing. That's my opinion. I think it's going to keep growing. I don't see that tapering off anytime soon. Um, like I just got a whole bunch of email notifications like less than an hour ago uh, from, uh, what's that website? Haveibeenpwned.com. Uh, apparently Gravatar that turns your email address into your little uh, picture. Apparently they got hacked and somebody leaked like 115 million uh, combinations of like your name, your MD5 hashed email address and like your photo or something like that. Uh, someone was doing research and leaked it online. So some, you know, apparently they've been able to like rainbow table the email addresses um, and, and figure out a bunch of emails from it. So yeah, security is not going away anytime soon. I think that's always going to be around for sure. Um, Hey Dodo, what's going on? Just switched from Chrome to Safari. My work has a similar rule. DevOps guys will be thrilled. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I think security and DevOps are, are the two things that are not going to go away anytime soon. Now, the idea of what DevOps is and how you're taking care of those servers and how you're how we actually end up deploying things, that's not going to go away. I think we're going to see, I think at some point we're going to see a bit of a consolidation in the cloud infrastructure market. I mean, Amazon right now is like the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Um, Google and Azure are also really big. Oracle has a cloud. Um, Salesforce, I think, have their own cloud. Like there are a bunch of other like pretty decent named companies who are also building up their own cloud infrastructure. But I think we're going to start seeing that cloud infrastructure kind of merge and consolidate to grow to be able to compete against the top three of Amazon, Google, and Azure. Um, and Google and Azure are absolutely playing catch up to AWS. AWS is like rolling out all kinds of stuff. It's like you need a database. We got eight or, or 12 now. I think they've got like 12 different kinds of databases now. It's like, you need a database? We got some kind of database you can use. Where Google's like, we got two, maybe three. Azure's like, we got one. <laughs> Unless you spin up your own server and like put your own software on there and like manage and maintain and do all your own replication, then you can have whatever you want. Um, but I think that we're gonna see a lot more competition. Um, Heroku is a cloud for Oracle. Heroku is actually built on top of AWS. Um, so I don't think Heroku is doing the cloud for Oracle. If they are, then Oracle's on AWS too, which is kind of weird. I thought Oracle was doing their own like separate cloud, but I could be wrong on that. I just know that Oracle has some kind of cloud offering. Um, so I thought it was a standalone, but I could be wrong. But yeah, I think, I think like how we, how we actually deploy onto the cloud and make things available, um, that process is always changing. I mean, we used to just log in, rename a script to today's date, upload the new script and, and now we've deployed our code. That was how we did things like 25 years ago. Um, and that was our backup plan. It's like, oh, we found a bug. Quick, delete that script, rename the other one back and we'll carry on. Um, it was a really janky way of doing things back in the day. And, and since then, now we've got like, you know, Git pipelines and Git workflows, uh, CI CD pipelines and all that kind of stuff to like make sure that everything's working well before it actually deploys. But at some point, Somebody somewhere has to build or automate a process of getting that code out onto a live server to actually be available to the general interwebs. Um, now, how things are going to deploy and work with Web3 is going to be like a whole other thing. And I will be the first one to tell you, uh, and I'm happy to admit, I am blissfully ignorant about Web3. Um, I know a little bit about crypto, but I think this whole NFT thing is a bit of a scam, honestly. I think it's, uh, I think it's rife for fraud 
and I know that that's what it's trying to defeat. But we've actually seen people like download stuff off the chain uh, and now say like, no, I own the thing. Um, and so I think, I think at, like until that really gets settled of like, hey, take a screenshot of Ian on his live stream and sell that for a billion dollars as an NFT. Um, okay. Like, why am I going to pay like $3 million for a fraction of a share or, or pay a fraction of, you know, some $3 million pot to have a fractional ownership share in a picture of the Declaration of Independence? Like, that just seems really bizarre to me. Like the whole idea of NFTs, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not bought in. I'm not sold on it. I understand crypto. And I think, I think the authenticity of a crypto chain, like you own something, I got it on the chain before you. And so if you put that thing on the chain, everybody can see I did it first. I think that's important, especially when it comes to content creation. I'm all for crypto and I'm all for blockchain for producing content and showing who published what, when, um, so that we have validation that somebody did a thing at a specific date and time before somebody else did. I absolutely buy in on that. I think that's fantastic. The whole NFT thing though, I don't know. I think it's I think it's a pyramid scheme. So we'll see. The point is ownership. I mean, I, I would love to have somebody like sit down and educate me on it because I mean, the way that I've been reading up on it, it, it doesn't make sense to me. And what I am reading just, it doesn't make me feel any more confident that NFTs are like, like a legitimate thing. Like it's not a legitimate asset. Um, and, and you only own the thing that that blockchain says you own. If I go over to some other blockchain, it's probably not there unless somebody's publishing it on all the blockchains. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm not bought into it. Is that a maple leaf on my hat? Yeah, it is. I'm originally from Canada. Um, so this is my, this is my hat from Roots. It's, uh, it's a famous clothing brand up in Canada. So yeah, gotta, gotta shout out my, my Canucks. For sure. Hito Kiri, good to see you in chat. Um, <laughs> well, when he says it like that. Um, I don't think it's the technology uh, being the part that I dislike. I think it's just the idea of, oh, Ian gave me a bunch of money, so I'm going to tell everybody that Ian owns this picture of some gorilla picking his nose. Um, when someone else can say, oh, show me that picture, and they grab a copy of it, and now they have a copy of that thing that I'm supposed to like digitally own. Well, how do I know who downloaded that copy? I can't go after all of them for ownership and copyright and whatever. Like if they turn around, they publish that in some magazine. How do I even know? And like, it's not stopping anybody from making copies of things. And so, yeah, it, you know, if like, let's say Dota 2 sells me that picture of the gorilla picking his nose. According to Dota, I own that picture according to that blockchain. But like I said, unless that's being published out to multiple blockchains, like, does everybody else on the other blockchains know that I own that picture of that gorilla picking his nose? Like, I don't know. That's that's what I'm ignorant about. Van Radius says, no wonder I'm so polite. Yeah. The number one way to get a Canadian to apologize to you is step on their foot. They will say, sorry. Um, you can see ownership off the blockchain. That's the point. You can add, you can also copy in real life stuff. Yeah. I Like I said, I'm ignorant about it. I don't know nearly enough about it to have an educated stance. And and I'm applying for these developer relations jobs and I'm finding these really cool companies that are like, we do everything on blockchain and we're like into NFTs. And I'm like, I don't have the qualifications to be like super excited about that. Because as of right now, tonight, like I'm not going to be able to stand up in front of people and go, yeah, totally buy into the NFT thing. I need to be genuine about what I do in my job. I need to care about what the company does. And if you're into crypto and NFTs, like it's just not my thing. Honestly, this is not my thing. So I think kind of going back to the original question of like, you know, uh, what's not going to change over time and, and the idea of DevOps. DevOps is like what DevOps actually is, I think is going to constantly change. Just like what is programming, what is development and, and you know, what constitutes like a web developer. All of that kind of stuff changes. Languages change, frameworks change. But I think Web3 is gonna drastically change like how we deploy things and how we prove like uh, certain things from the authenticity point of view. Um, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like I do like that about blockchain. You can prove that something happened at a specific date and time that gets propagated out and so it's decentralized. I totally believe in all that. Um, but I was seeing, like I saw something on Twitter like 
within the last week where they're talking about like, oh, you know, someone copied all these things, all these NFTs. And they're like, well, maybe we should have like one central authority, like take care of who owns everything. And they're like, so that kind of gets rid of the idea of decentralization if we're putting it all back into one place, doesn't it? So, yeah, I think, yeah, I just, I don't understand it enough. So I can't answer questions, but I'm also not going to be applying for jobs in, in that realm. I was talking to uh, one company last week and, and I'm kind of, I'm pretty interested in, in joining their team, to be honest. It's a startup. Uh, well, they're not really a startup. They've been around a while. They've got millions of users on their platform and they deal with stock trading and they want to get into crypto and NFTs. And I'm like, eh. But at the same time, it would be like they would bring me in at like a super senior role, like almost like a like assistant vice president of engineering kind of thing um, where they would want me to get into like more leadership and manage the team and grow the team and coach the team and stuff like that. I'm like, I could do that. Uh, that would be cool. I just wouldn't be the go to guy if they got a question about crypto or NFTs. Um, but uh, but it, it was also a pretty interesting uh, company. So I need to get in touch with them this week because they were asking when I want to schedule my next interviews with them so um let's see so why am i applying that i mean it's it's interesting because it's stock trading and um my whole career i have very purposefully kept an open mind about how the world works but also realized i don't know how the world works and so my first job in california uh like i'm moving to the states i got you know, I got the work visa and whatever. You come into the States and you get a social security number and I've got no credit history. So I can't apply for a credit card. I, I literally have like, you know, whatever the bottom credit score is like 450 or something like that. I had zero credit. I had no credit history whatsoever. And so nobody wants to give me a credit card. And they're like, how are you in your mid twenties and you just now have a social security number? I'm like, well, I'm an immigrant. Um, and so that first job in California was a credit report processing company like that's all we did is we took people's socials we ran their credit and we got to you know kind of parse out their their credit report and put it up on a web interface and so i did like the devops and the security side of like keeping all that data protected and uh thankfully knock on wood uh to my knowledge they've never had a security breach i set up all kinds of honeypots and things like that and, and they, we did security audits with the uh, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. They never once were able to break into our systems. Um, and so that made me feel really good. Like even a couple of years after I left, like all that stuff was left in place and they still couldn't break into it like years later. So that made me feel pretty good that I was able to kind of learn and build that kind of stuff up. But I didn't know how credit happened or worked in the United States. And so I stayed at that job for four years, almost four years, and I learned like ridiculous tips on credit and personal finance and like how to take care of your money and like all this kind of stuff and all the little tricks that the credit card companies aren't going to tell you about how to build up a good credit rating um and now i've got like an 830 score like 850 is a perfect score and i'm like almost perfect on a credit rating um and a lot of that is just because i'm missing 26 years of of credit history and so they they look all the way back and go you know you only just got this you know in 2000 so you only have 21 years of credit history for somebody that's 47 like you should have more credit history and so that lowered my score a little bit kind of permanently um, but learning all the tricks and so I went from that into ed tech and I went from that into e-commerce because I wanted to learn how e-commerce worked and then I did that again at another job where I implemented um, an API for doing microtransactions because I wanted to know how e-commerce worked on on the internet like what are the best practices and how can things you know kind of send packets back and forth um so i got into e-commerce i got into ad tech i got into marketing i did freelance work where i did just work for all kinds of groups where i got into like entertainment and and stuff like that um what else did i do i went from ad tech into the gaming uh community and i worked for a gaming company that's where i uh, built up their um, uh, microtransaction api um and i got into like community management and learning you know about like how do you make games and what goes into actually making like a casual game um, and then like the game mechanics of how do you make it sticky how do you make you know how do you keep people coming back how do you deal with that psychology side of things and then i went from that into uh, sendgrid where i was learning everything about email like everything possible about email and then went from that into um, uh, energy so i worked for a company that was teaching consumers how to lower their energy footprint in the world 
um, just again, like I didn't know anything about how energy worked and how like the power plants are actually paid by the government if they can lower their overall footage or footprint because you know they want to build all these new neighborhoods but the the power plant can only produce a fixed amount of energy and so how do they get everybody else to lower their usage so that all these other neighborhoods can pop up um so if you ever played like sim city kind of thing you, you get to build like one power plant and it powers like a certain amount of of buildings um it's it's that kind of principle and so like learning how all that worked and the whole government process behind it and the bureaucracy of it is actually pretty interesting to get into went from that into stream which is another SaaS platform uh, which is just APIs for like powering how everybody else can have live chat and an activity feed like uh, Twitch doesn't use stream but like for example if Twitch used stream like all of your chat messages would be like going out to their server and like how do we aggregate that and how do people interact with those things and uh, you know making activity feeds like a Twitter or an Instagram kind of thing and just seeing the companies that were building their entire company and product on what we were doing at stream is, was pretty fascinating. I got into developer relations, I got into pre-sales engineering, um, I got into um, a lot more technical writing, like I was doing a lot of stuff at that job and so it like opened my eyes to a bunch of things and then I got into teaching and then I went back to stream and now I, I'm like, okay, I really like developer relations because it's kind of the teaching without the, uh, like the attachment to students uh, is basically what I'm looking for at this point, so. Um, and so the reason that I would be interested in taking this particular job with this company that does stocks is because I know I know about stock trading. I've been doing it for years, but I've never been so down in the weeds to like really understand the nuance of it. Besides knowing that like people are building like custom hardware that, you know, as the as the network packet comes in that says Ian just sold like 10 shares of Google, um, that that hardware isn't even sending it to the broker before it turns around and says, well, go buy those 10 shares quick. Um, or, you know, something just happened in the market where this thing like went up or went down and, and this hardware is actually making the buy and sell decisions and, and at a like speed of light transaction basis, trying to send a packet back with instructions of like, I was told to watch that when the price went to here, like go buy it or when it hit this, go sell it. Um, and so it's like, you know, this stuff's like interacting at a almost a microsecond level like it's happening really really fast so i know those kinds of things but like the overall like stock market and, and the fluctuations and stuff i don't know very much about that and so taking that job like i can go apply all my engineering principles and what i do know about stock trading and, and equity and things like that and i can go apply that at the job but i'm going to learn so much more about that and that's how i like to run my career I want to find a job where I'm going to continue to grow, not just somewhere where I've got skill that I can bring to them. I mean, that's certainly a big part of taking a job is you need to convince them like, hey, I've got these skills, you should hire me. But I want to end up at a job where I know I'm going to learn something about the world that I haven't learned yet. And stock and, and, and trading and things like that is one of those areas. Um, at the same time, there are jobs that I won't go apply for, like a full government, like I won't ever go work at a full government bureaucracy kind of business because I don't want to, I don't want to wear a shirt and tie. That's a dumb reason. I'd rather wear like a pullover sweater and a ball cap. That's just how I roll. If, if you want me to code, I'm going to be comfortable and I'm not going to be comfortable with a tie like choking me. So anyway, let me catch up on chat. I know I, <laughs> I kind of went off uh, telling stories again. But that's why I, I want to like go work at that uh, that company. Uh, Van Radius, if I already missed you, uh, see you next time. Um, this brown man says, thanks for the feedback. What's your honest opinion on graduate programs in CS and cybersecurity? I'm currently due for graduation this spring. My degree already landed me an intro position. Should I look into a graduate degree or look into certs? Um, to be honest, I mean, because I don't have that much of a security background myself. I've never actually looked into the job requirements. It would be interesting though, for you to start networking with people in those jobs and say, hey, would a master's degree help me? Like, would it, would it actually advance me any more than just my bachelor's degree? That would be the first question I would ask. In computer science, for example, if you go get a bachelor's degree in computer science, and then you get a master's degree in computer science, you're not doing any different work. The only difference is that you're going to expect to get paid more because you've got more student debt to pay off. Um, and so recruiters will, will look at, at your education history and sometimes will go, you have a bachelor's and a master's? 
eh, we might pass because you're just going to ask for extra money just because you have the extra education when there may not be like anything super amazing about what you developed as part of that master's degree but if you have a background in something else like say communication and then you get a master's degree in computer science then they'll be like yeah okay we'll talk to you because yeah you have a master's degree but your computer science knowledge is more like associates level at that point because you've only done like a two-year amount of cs and so even though you've got a master's in computer science you're really coming out with like associates degree level of computer science knowledge but they know that they're not going to have to pay you the same as they would pay somebody with a master with a bachelor and a master's in computer science your salary is going to come in a little bit lower um, there are companies out there that will look at those kinds of things to, to make that consideration. Um, as far as certifications, though, Stephen Hungry says, I've heard certs are useless. Sometimes. Some of them are needed, though, because they are very specific focused training on a particular element. And so, again, like network within the industry, like find other people that are into uh, like security ops, SecOps, DevSecOps, InfoSec, like find people in there and say, would a master's degree help me? If not, what certifications do you think would help me more than just getting the degree that I'm working towards? Um, and then kind of collect a lot of information. Don't just talk to one person. Talk to like five people. Talk to 10 people. Talk to a lot of folks about what their opinion is. And then take, a, take an objective look at that data and say like, you know, three out of 10 people said that that master's degree would help me. Seven out of 10 think it's not going to help me. So, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good chance that you don't need the master's degree. Like it could help maybe, but not, it's not like all 10 people are like, oh yeah, absolutely. You need to go get that degree. At the same time, they might all give you a mix of ideas about what certifications could be helpful in the industry. So I would, I would, uh, I would survey a lot of people in the industry, like start that networking and find out from them, like, Hey, should I work towards a master's or just keep what I got? And, and if I keep what I got, should I bother with certifications or not? They might just say, you know what? The bachelor's degree is all you're going to need. You're going to learn way more on the job. I mean, that's typically how it is in computer science. Like you learn how to program, you go get a development job and you don't do like 90% of what you just learned in that degree or diploma. Um, and everything else that you are going to learn, you're learning on the job. Extreme dude. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Um, so I'm Ian. I wrote this website called Tech Interview Guide, um, and I'm just here to help people get better at uh, tech interviews and, and career development in the tech industry. So I've been in the industry for 25 years, and I'm just kind of like sharing perspectives and ideas. Uh, I've been a hiring manager in engineering. I've been, you know, contributor for a long, long time. I've been doing programming for quite a while. So just uh, we're just chatting about like security operations and growth in that uh, in that area. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, scrolling back through, uh, Van Radius was actually saying something similar. I think getting just experience under the belt and seeing what it's like would be a better alternative. Um, and then Dota was following up on my thing about the stock job. Like, do I want to work in the financial industry? Kind of. I mean, fintech is pretty interesting. But again, a lot of newer fintech is being built on blockchain, which I haven't actively built a project on blockchain yet. Um, it's like, it's on my to-do list, but it's like way down the list because it's not something I'm super passionate about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would go work in FinTech. I think it's, it's another, I think it's another industry that's going to try to disrupt a lot of what I think a lot of government institutions are trying to do as far as like, uh, you know, what the fed is doing with interest rates and lending and all that kind of stuff. Like there, there was one group that I saw today where they're like, you know what? We want to we want to disrupt the banking industry, not not just to say, hey, look at us, we're disrupting the banking industry, but because they legitimately see the real thing in the world that's happening is like people that are not white dudes, um, they tend to get discriminated against, and they're very marginalized when it comes to finances. Their interest rates are higher. They're less likely to get a loan. They're treated very poorly as customers. And this company is like, we don't care who you are, what your background is, like. If you need a bank account, we're going to give you a bank account. Um, and and that kind of thing, like where they're, where they're being genuine about it. They're not just like, hey, look at us. We're going to, you know, be the next cool thing in banking. They're like, no, we're legitimately here to help solve a, a, a problem that's going on in society. Um, that kind of stuff is really meaningful to me, too. Um, all right. So kind of keep going through chat. Um, can I do a resume review today? Yes. 
um, send me a resume right now and um, if you haven't already and I will do a resume review right now um, and while you do that I'm gonna continue to go through chat uh, there are more financial companies than the blockchain ones, yeah. But a lot of them are starting to build on blockchain. Um, I also feel that most degrees after an undergrad are for individuals who want to join academia. Yeah, to some degree. I mean, PhDs, there, there are really, really big companies out there that will hire PhDs just for pure research. Um, but having a PhD and then wanting to get into like, hey, I just want to like kick back and code with everybody else. They may not hire you because you're going to be so overqualified for that role. Um, or they're going to think that you're going to leave as soon as you get some kind of, uh, uh, you know, research type of job. Uh, Extreme Jude, uh, first time in chat. Good to see you there. I'm a CS student in Canada. Hey, Roots. Welcome. Uh, I am a fellow Canuck. Uh, for a summer software developer engineer internship and my week is going okay. Awesome. Uh, a little bogged down with all the applications. Yeah, you and me both. I'm on a job hunt myself. Um, but yeah, welcome. Welcome to the, uh, welcome to the stream. It's good to have you here. Uh, I'm curious, Extreme Dude, what part of Canada are you in? I, uh, I grew up in Northwest Territories, and I went to high school and college in Ontario uh, at the end of the Great Lakes. And then I moved up to Ottawa to start my career in firmware development. So I studied computer engineering, which is really low-level code, a lot of C and assembly. Um, I didn't, like, it wasn't a typical computer science type of degree. Uh, we did learn some algorithms and data structures, but um, it was mostly on, like, how do the chips actually work and how do we write code to make the chips actually do something? Um, and so if, if I were taking that course nowadays, it would be, it would be rebranded instead of computer engineering, it'd be like internet of things, you know, engineer, uh, kind of thing. Um, Dota is also Canadian. Dude, where are you from in, in Canada? I didn't know that you were from Canada too. Got all kinds of Canucks hanging out on the stream tonight. All right, let me go check my email and see if, uh, somebody just sent over a resume and I will do a resume review as promised. Let me pull this up over here. Let me go over to the thing. All right. So somebody just, well, somebody sent me a resume 41 minutes ago. Um, Extreme Dudes in Ontario. Cool. Nova Scotia. Oh, you're in Windsor. Oh, sweet. So we actually figured out. So my my mom and my sister live around Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge area. And I actually did the math. Flying into Toronto and renting a car to drive down to Waterloo is more expensive than flying into Detroit and renting a van and driving the rest of the way <laughs> by like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, and so now we just do that. We rent a van and we cross the border and we hang out with family in Canada and we just drive back. It's great. Kids sit like way, way back in the third row of the van so we don't have to hear them yattering out about Minecraft and we can just kind of tune out and watch all the, uh, uh, not solar panels, the wind turbine stuff uh, between Windsor and, and Cambridge. Cool. Um, So if somebody on the stream sent me a resume like 41 minutes ago, I don't want to say your name because I don't want to like out you um, because none of your names match the email address that came in. Um, but if one of you sent me a ping graphic of a screenshot of an anonymized resume, um, just tell me in chat like, yeah, that was mine. Um, but if you're preparing one, oh, this is Steve. The name on the resume is Steve. So... Stephen Hungry, I presume that this is yours. So I will go ahead and do a resume review. How's that sound? Cool. So this is one thing that I really, really like to do on the stream. I always start my resume reviews with, uh, with the following. Opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple. Some of them stink. Now, I showered right before the stream, so mine don't stink. But my, my general advice with even with everything I tell you on my stream, don't ever just listen to my opinion on something. Um, I've got a lot of opinions, but I'm also just another white dude on the internet giving opinions. I like to have other people on my stream share their opinions. That's why I had Josh on the stream Thursday night to go over resumes, um, just so we could kind of see like, what is HR like about a resume? What is a hiring manager in engineering like about a resume? Just so we see a lot more perspectives. So don't ever just listen to one person say, oh, this is how you should do a resume. 
I've looked at probably 15,000 resumes over my career. And so there are things that I like to see, where I like to see them. I have opinions on what I think makes a good resume, but they're my opinions. They are my biases. So I'm gonna go over your resume, but just keep in mind that all of the feedback I'm about to give you doesn't mean you have to go change and you have to do it my way. If I was a hiring manager right now at a company where you were applying, then yeah, do it my way because I'm going to notice your resume. But I'm not a hiring manager right now and I'm not working at any company right now. So um, so you can take my advice for, for what it's worth with that, okay? So I just I always preface my resume reviews with that. Don't ever just listen to one person's opinion about how to build a resume. Listen to a lot of opinions and then decide yourself, this is how I'm going to build a resume. After absorbing all this advice, this is how I'm going to do the thing. All right, so let me switch my screen. Let me go find that browser. Browser, browser, browser. There's my browser. And I'm going to go find... Oh, wait, that's a photo. That is going to be this one. And then I need, why won't that actually show up on the screen? Hmm. OBS, you're failing me. All right, let's try this again. Um, window. All right, let me see if I can pull that into a browser instead. Oops, shoot. All right, bear with me a second. I'm gonna see if I can pull that image into a browser because I know I can get a browser in here and then we'll go from there. Hey, uh, by the way, if you're on the stream and you were and you were also on the stream Thursday night when I did all the uh, dragon giveaways, if you have not sent me your mailing address, you gotta send it to me now. I wanna mail these things out tomorrow morning. Um, so if you have not yet sent me your mailing address, um, either send me a whisper on Twitch and send me your mailing address or connect with me on LinkedIn. There's my LinkedIn uh, profile. And anybody else on the channel, you're welcome to connect with me too on LinkedIn. Um, but connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a direct message uh, with your mailing address so I can get these mailed out to you. Um, let me go find my downloads folder and a non-resume. There we go. All right, let's try this. And we're going to go do Chrome. Oh, that is really not behaving. All right, let's try this. Um, all right, hopefully this will work. It is not going to work. All right, so let me, no. I just want to remove that I will figure this out I promise where is Chrome there we go all right here is Stephen Hungry's resume sorry for the, de the delay there um Dota asks I'm curious and you can also feel free to answer later how practiced are you at coding at the moment I mean I code all the time um I think it matters for dev relations more than people realize yeah absolutely um, and so a lot of my, um, a lot of my presentations that I've been doing for my developer relations interviews have actually been some amount of coding or live coding. Um, like on Friday, I did a, a talk or a, like my presentation for Twilio, which is a DevRel role uh, at an enterprise level. And uh, they're like, we want you to do a presentation where you're actually live coding something. And so I live coded the little Python script where I, uh, I do my video transcription or the, uh, the video um, extraction for uh, the podcast and so on. All right, so let's dive in on Steve's resume. Um, so you can reach me at, got email, GitHub, website, phone number. The thing with emails and GitHubs and websites and so on, like I can see that it's gonna be a phone number. So you could probably drop the labels on here, but it depends how much room you actually need on here. Um, so you've got some experience, you've got more experience, you've done some freelance work. So I mean, as far as experience goes, that's gonna trump any project work that you've got. Um, having the vertical bar in here to find the dates is a little bit harder. I would probably see if you can p 
push those dates out to uh, out to the the column over here you can kind of see my magnifying glass on the screen hopefully I would probably move the dates to the same line as like the company name and just push it up against this right border instead of being over here because the dates aren't in a consistent spot on the page like as we scroll down like they're kind of jumping around a little bit um, as well as like the duration of time so just let them calculate the duration of time you can take the duration of time off of there completely but I would move these dates like over here to the right edge on the same line as company one. And then under that, just the title uh, is really all you need. Um, so yeah, we take the duration off. I'm also not a fan of the vertical bar. Um, I actually did some, some reading on um, the psychology of reading and vertical bars are actually very interruptive to your reading process because we don't usually see them. And so when we see it, our brain's like, what's this doing here? Oh, I can ignore it, carry on. And so it's very interruptive to kind of the flow of what you're doing. Um, so I usually tell people like, get rid of vertical bars. If you're gonna, if you really need a separator, use just white space or a comma or something like that. Um, so yeah, so I would drop the headers of email, GitHub, website, phone number. Um, I would put a LinkedIn profile on here. If you've got LinkedIn, um, I would put LinkedIn on there. As far as the technology goes, I see language, 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 library, framework, 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 library. I'm assuming these are libraries. Now with more libraries. Now we're getting into testing. Then we get into like a backend infrastructure and then framework and then tool and then web wrapper around that tool. Uh, and then I see more tools and with a tool now with a database and now cloud platforms and then back to libraries. So I would probably group these up by like, here are all the languages I know. Here are all the frameworks I've used. Here are all the libraries that I use on a regular basis. And then here are all the other tools that I utilize. And I would group them up a little bit more. I think it'll just be a lot easier for them to spot. Now, I, I always tell people, and, and I would get rid of the slash. I would just put a comma in between these things. Um, I also tell people when, when you're applying for a job, you wanna leave the most relevant content on your resume. So if, if you go check out the website, I think chapter nine, I talk about all about resumes. Um, and, and the first thing that I, that I have on the website is this riddle that I learned when I was a little kid. And it was just this goofy riddle, but coming into career development later made sense. It says, how do you make a sculpture of an elephant? You take a big block of concrete and you chip away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. And so when we think about resumes, how do you look like the perfect candidate? You start with a really big resume where you list absolutely everything about you and your background and everything you've ever done. You make a copy of it and you trim it back down to one page to make you look like the perfect candidate. And so you're gonna take off the things that don't matter to that company. So like, um, for example, if they don't do any database work whatsoever, don't put Postgres on here. I mean, you can if you want, but it's not important to them, or at the very least, like keep it at the bottom of the list of things. But like, for example, when I look over this resume, I see you're a JavaScript developer with a lot of framework experience and you do some testing. But let's say I was looking for a TypeScript developer you should be putting TypeScript first on that list and then JavaScript afterward. Because when we read, like when humans read lists of things, when we, when we see a bullet point list going left to right, we kind of automatically make this assumption that the thing on the left, you know better than the thing on the right. And it's the same thing with a vertical stack. The thing at the top, you know better than the thing at the bottom. And so you have to kind of have that mindset when you're building up these skills blocks or when you're arranging projects on your resume is how people are gonna interpret these lists. And so when I look at this, I would think, like I just naturally gravitate towards, you know, JavaScript better than TypeScript, but you know, JavaScript better than HTML, you know, HTML better than CSS, you know, Angular better than, you know, Vue, and you know, Vue better than, you know, React, but you know, Angular, Vue, and React better than, you know, Express, because Express is like way down the list. Now, I also get that, you know, we're talking front-end frameworks versus the back-end framework, but it's still, it's a framework and, and how you're developing out your apps and things like that. And so if you keep that in mind, then when you actually go find a job where you want to apply and you look at the requirements of that job, you can now tailor your resume to look just like that job post where they're saying, we're looking for a JavaScript developer who knows Postgres and has experience in Node and Express. Well, guess what? This resume is gonna list JavaScript, Postgres, Node, and Express because that's the skills they're looking for. And so you need to make that really prominent for me to find on this page because that's what I'm looking for. I need to be able to see in a hurry 
that you are a JavaScript developer who has worked with Postgres and you can use Express. But then you have a spacing issue. Well, I'm not saying those are the only things. I'm just saying like you're going to make those more prominent. Like you would put those at the top or like maybe throw some bold on there or something just to really grab my attention because that was in the job post. So if you want to keep this whole skills block, you can. But if their job post is looking for JavaScript, Postgres, Node, and Express, like throw some bold or something on those terms. So you're drawing my attention and drawing my eyesight to that. As soon as I look at that skills block, I'm like, oh, JavaScript, Postgres, Node, Express. That's what I'm looking for. Cool. This is in the maybe pile. And I'm like, because I'm going through hundreds of these going, yep, yep, nope, 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 yep, nope. When I'm looking at a resume, I'm looking for a reason to say no because I've got hundreds of them. I want to call like 10 people, maybe 15 people. And of those, I want to interview like five. And of those, I want to hire one. That's typically how I would work as a hiring manager. I want to be able to narrow these down to like maybe a dozen, see who I can call, see who's available, see when I can start that interview process with you because I think you've got the skill. But I'm certainly not reading every word on this page. I will, right before I get on that call with you, now I'm like, okay, now I've got to call Steve. Let me pull this up. Let me look at all the things that Steve knows so I can start to frame the questions that I'm going to ask you on that call. Go, oh, hey, tell me about this job with company one. Like, you know, you were leading these front end meetings. What was that about? What kind of leadership role was that? How were you leading those meetings? Um, did you ever have a time where you got to cancel that meeting or did you ever get feedback that that meeting was a waste of time? How'd you handle that? I can start to come up with questions for you based on what you've got on your resume that I can sort of poke at a little bit when I get you on the phone. Um, so just kind of catching back up on, on chat here. So, um, E3 seems misplaced. Yeah. So again, so if you're kind of grouping them up, I would group them by language, then by framework, then by library. Um, if you specifically want to call out testing, then you could have like a little subheader of like testing tools and then list like all the testing that you do. Um, but that's up to you if you want to break that into, into a separate thing. And then after that, I would just say tools where I would do like Git, GitHub, Docker, Kubernetes, um, AWS, GCP. But again, if I'm looking for somebody with AWS experience, AWS better be at the front of that list on that line. Because again, I'm reading left to right for what you know more than something else. Uh, I'm just going through chat here again. Um, oops, where did that go? When I wrote this, I wanted to work in microservices, but honestly, I'm over those. Yeah, um, I get that. TDD and the surrounded body stuff is not on there also. Object-oriented programming, I probably wouldn't bother with OOP. I mean, if they specifically say, like, we're looking for somebody that's really strong in OOP, then you put that on your resume. Because, again, it's a keyword that they're going to be searching for. And so, it, like, the keywords in their job post, you want to make sure those keywords are on your resume. Because that's how the applicant tracking system is finding you to give, to give your resume to HR. HR is really just looking for a match of, like, okay, well, they said all the things. I guess they have that skill. Let me call them, make sure they're a living, breathing human being, and then I'm going to hand them off to Ian. And now I'm going to do the technical phone screen. That's typically the process that'll go through. But someone in HR is going to call you first and just set up like, hey, we're going to get you in the process. Just want to talk about a few things here on your resume, you know, confirm like dates, blah, 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 and go from there. Um, extreme dude also submit a resume. Sweet. I can, I can get to that one uh, next if you want. Um, recruiters don't know acronyms. Yeah. And we saw that with Josh on the stream on, on Thursday. Josh was like, I don't know what this thing is. And there was one acronym I didn't know. Someone had a bunch of Salesforce uh, background and they, they listed a skill of SOQL, which is the, I guess, the uh, Salesforce object query language or something like that. I'd never heard of it because I don't know Salesforce. And so I'm looking at this going, that means nothing to me. Like if I was literally hiring you for a job and you put SOQL on your resume and that's not part of my job description, I'm like, I'm mentally discarding it. It's not important information to me. The resume should just show me these are the skills that I'm bringing that you're looking for. These are the extra things that I'm bringing on how I'm going to help make the team even better. Um, and so the resume is really just a list of facts of what you know and how you're going to make things better at my company, how you're going to make my team better. Um, so anything that you can highlight around that. But at, at a minimum, you need to highlight that you have the skills I'm even looking for in the person that I want to hire for that job. Uh, funny enough, I had a recruiter say, oh, so you know TDD, and I replied, pretty sure that acronym isn't on the resume, which is which is fine. Not every recruiter is 
going to be uh, ignorant about web technologies. I actually know web developers that got into recruiting. And so never, never presume that just because they're an HR or a recruiter role that they don't have a technical background. Um, if they are a, an in-house recruiter for a technical company, they've probably gone through some amount of like initial training just to check that you're not like just, you know, spouting buzzwords to sound smart or whatever. Um, so yeah, don't, don't make an assumption like that. I mean, I have definitely worked with recruiters. They're like, yeah, I don't know what this, you know, MYSQL thing is. Could you explain that? It's like MySQL is a database engine. It's how we store data. Um, and they're like, oh, okay, cool. Well, I saw that on the job post and, you know, so I mean, there are, there are recruiters that don't know, uh, technical acronyms. You are right, but some of them will. So don't, don't ever get on a call and presume that they don't know. Um, if they, if they ask about it, cool. And if they say something like, Hey, I see, you know, TDD, you're like, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. So what's up trash dev. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> never see you anywhere. Well, the guy did just move. So give him a break. He's, he's like unpacking boxes and I got one more box uh, heading your way tomorrow. Trash dev. I got that uh, dragon packed up for you. Um, cool. So Steve, hopefully that was helpful. I mean, as far as the, the other layout goes, um, I like that this job, you have a lot more bullet points than the next job, and that has more bullet points than the last job. I think that that's fine. Um, the freelance stuff, I, honestly, I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't put the dates on here. Um, I mean, for me, myself, if you go look at my LinkedIn, I have like an iandouglas.com where I've been like consulting for 20 something years, 23 years or something like that, because that's when I registered iandouglas.com like way back in the day. Um, and I'll like, I'll pick up a contract here or there, or like a little consulting thing, or like, I'll just consult on whatever. And I'll just list that as part of my ongoing consultation thing. So you could just say June, 2018 to present and just say, these are three notable things that I've done as part of that freelance work. Now, some companies are like, oh, I don't know if I want to hire you full time if you're also doing freelance. And so you may want to say like, you know, um, June, 2018 to December, 2021. And then we say, oh, tell me about the freelance thing. Just say, yeah, I just, I wanted to shut it down because I want to focus on full-time work. So I, I probably wouldn't put a, you know, an end present uh, kind of date on a freelance job. If you're trying to apply for a full-time role, I would probably make it look like you've ended that or that you're about to wrap it up because some companies are a little skittish about hiring full-time developers who are also doing stuff on the side because they're worried that you're going to pick up some side project and you're gonna get like dinged about that during the day and now your attention is divided. Or if it's a remote job, they're gonna be worried that you're actually doing daytime work for your side gig when they're hoping they're getting your nine to five kind of hours. So some things to think about there. Do I know somebody named Fernando Cardenas? Um, yes. Oh yeah, Fernando. Yeah, I know Fernando. Um, I think we actually had lunch in Boulder like a number of years back. Yeah, I know Fernando. Um, I guess getting paid for side projects is a good thing. I mean, it can be. Cool. All right. Um, so, Steve, hopefully that was helpful. Um, overall, I think I think the length of your bullet points are, are also really good. Um, I'm not a big fan of like really long bullet points that wrap around the, on the multiple lines. So from that point of view, you're using very strong action verbs, like you overhauled, you worked on, you implemented, you standardized, you learned. Um, those kinds of things are all really good to, to have as far as action words. If you can quantify some of that, like overhauled QA process and technologies saving 300%, you know, uh, deployment time or something like that. Like if there's any way that you can quantify any of this by like throwing some numbers on here too, that always looks really, really good on a resume. If you can't, that's okay. But if you can quantify things on here, like led front end meetings, you know, how often? Were they weekly meetings? Were they monthly meetings, quarterly meetings? Uh, things like that. Um, cool, so hopefully that was helpful for you. Oh, he was your old boss, oh cool. Um, let's see, Steve, I think you forgot to put a colon after your GitHub header. Yep, that's true. Yep, I missed it too at first. Nobody's ever noticed that. Cool, all right, well, it looks like someone else sent over a resume, so let me go find that real quick. New message. 
All right. So Extreme Dude, is that the spoiler resume that just got emailed to me? Is that one yours? Just let me know in chat if spoiler resume is yours. Yep, okay, cool. And so I will keep in mind the things that you're asking for in the message. Uh, looking for things I can do better, considering I'm looking for my first ever technical internship. Mostly run out of places in Canada for now to apply. I've been shifting my attention to the States. Can I get a realistic expectation on applying internationally, especially for just an internship? I think a lot of companies are like, they don't care where you live anymore uh, for uh, remote roles. Um, if the internship requires you to be on site, they may offer to fly you there, but for an internship, they may not. So um, I made a spreadsheet as well to track all the places I've applied to. Sweet. Um, is there something wrong with doing that? Absolutely not. Um, I do something myself actually. Um, I use, What's that service called? I'll find it faster by like looking back at a Shopify job that I was applying for. I'm just gonna pick one of these up, apply now, and that's gonna take me over to Smarter or something like that. There it is, smarter.com. Nope, not smarter.com smarter.me um, so I use smarter.me and it's got like all the roles and stuff that I'm applying for here so I can go in and it gives you like all these nice columns and stuff like that so cool let's get into a resume for uh, for extreme dude cool all right um, at first glass glance kind of zooming out there's there's a fair bit of content on here it's fine that you've like inked this stuff out that's fine uh, I'm not too concerned about that. Um, but there is a lot of content on here, a lot of bullet points that wrap around a, a new line. And I would generally advise, like, try not to do that if you can. Um, also, these columns are equally balanced. You've made 50% columns. Um, applicant tracking systems, I've heard this as a theory, and I have not tested it, and I don't know for sure. But I have heard from exactly one person, so sample size one, that... ATS systems that see multiple columns, they put more weight on the right column than the left column. And so when it's looking for keywords, it's gonna say, hey, I found this keyword on the right side, but I found this keyword on the left side, but it's gonna get like a slightly less score because usually that left column, uh, like we saw with Stevens, um, it's, a, it's a much thinner column where everything else on the right is like the important content that you wanna get across. Um, and so I would generally advise, like if you're gonna do a two column format, make the left column like maybe even 40%, do 60% on the other side, where like the really important stuff that you want them to see about you is on that right side. Um, and that's typically where I would list out your skills and your projects. And then if you've got um, like other internship, like technical internship experience, I would put that at the bottom on that left side. All other like non-relevant experience would be at the bottom of the left column where your education would be up at the top. Um, and so you've got your education at the top. Um, and so you've actually done all that stuff already in that order. I would probably put the extracurricular uh, doing uh, Google hash code. I would probably put that up closer to the top on the uh, on that left column, right under your education, and then just other work experience. But again, for the other work experience, I think you could reduce that by by a fair bit. Um, like when I, when I look at over this, for example, like the teaching assistant job that you have here, it's cool that you've got a teaching background, but unless you're getting into ed tech, like some sort of education technology, you don't have to tell me this much stuff about being a teacher. Now, the fact that you were teaching computer science and programming and stuff, that is actually more relevant. And so I would keep that stuff on there. So I know I'm, I sound like I'm contradicting myself. So I'm just starting with the general advice and then getting into the more specifics. Um, and then uh, evaluating uh, students and so on, so that's fine. Um, Cheeto Bandito, thanks for the follow. It's a great name. Uh, welcome to the stream. Um, like accounting bookkeeper, it's like, okay, you like, I know what a bookkeeper does. Most people are gonna have like an approximate idea of like what a bookkeeper does. So do you need two bullet points? Could you just say like used QuickBooks, comma, you know, worked on personal and corporate taxes? Um, like again, unless you're going into like a financial technology role, you don't have to tell me so much about this accounting job. Now, if you are applying to a FinTech company, then that would be more relevant than the teaching information. And so maybe you don't need to tell me as much about the teaching. 
lead organizer for Winter Python Code Camp, that's actually pretty relevant. But again, I would try to reduce the, the bullet points to where they're not wrapping. Um, in this case, I mean, a lot of this is, is honestly pretty relevant work experience. Um, but I think if, if we can shrink that left column a little bit, it'll make the right column wider. I think then that we could work at reducing some of the text that you have over here on the right side to make more room down here at the bottom. Hopefully you can see my mouse pointer moving around. You can make more room down here at the bottom to put those really relevant work experience bits down at the bottom. So when I look at this resume, I see your skills, I see the projects where you practice those skills, and then I see like relevant work experience like the Python uh, thing and, and maybe the teaching um, or maybe that, uh, that assistant uh, internship, things like that. Um, cool, just looking back over chat here a little bit. Trash Dev is skeptical, skeptical about the column size. Yeah, like I said, I've only heard it from one person. Um, and so, I mean, take that for what it's worth. You're also hearing it from one person. But uh, no, this was a lady that uh, I watched a video on, on LinkedIn where she was actually like diving in on, on applicant tracking systems a little bit and, and how they actually parse the text. Because um, one thing that I usually tell people when you're sending me a PDF file is I usually start at the top here and I start highlighting stuff. And everything is highlighting here in order which is great, but sometimes when you highlight things on a PDF, it'll get a little janky. And as you're dragging down here, it'll start highlighting something over on this side, along with the stuff that you've highlighted up here, but it'll start to highlight stuff over here, and then it'll highlight back to here, and then it'll highlight something up here. And it's just something about how your word processor saves in a PDF file. Well, the problem with that is because that's how we are finding the text in the PDF file itself, that's how the applicant tracking system is also finding that text in the PDF file, which is why you always want to upload a doc file to an applicant tracking system and not a PDF. PDFs are for humans, doc files are for computers um, because the computer is not going to parse a PDF file as well, typically. So if you can get a doc file or a docx format, send that in when you're applying online, like where you're uploading a resume. And then if uh, later on when you're talking to a recruiter, you can say, hey, can I email you like a more up-to-date, like better format kind of resume? And then you can email it to them from there um, if you have it. So um, just looking over some other things in chat. I just worry about having keywords. Yeah, I mean, keywords are, are honestly one of the biggest things on here for sure. <laughs> Seeing Dota and, and Trash uh, kind of going back and forth, which is fine. It's what chat's for. Just keep it clean. Uh, will you even mention my previous internship? Yeah. I mean, if you're applying for an internship saying, like, I've already been an intern before, then they know, like, okay, you're going to have some knowledge about how this is going to work. Um, and you know that it's meant to be a temporary thing. Like, you're not, you're not joining their team permanently. Um, and so, yeah, I think I would absolutely keep the, uh, the previous internship on there for sure. Dota says the resume seems good. I don't know what would companies be interested in the most. Again, it depends on the company where where Extreme Dude is applying for an internship. Um, like I said, you know, you've got you've got a Flask app up here as uh, as a website. You've got an Alpha Bot um, Discord bot about popular Twitch streamer Tyler One uses Write API to give up to date information about League of Legends ranks. Uh, Twitch API to see if they've gone live on Twitch or not. And if so, what time you went live? Okay. So, I mean, again, if, if this kind of stuff is going to be relevant to my company, keep it on the resume. Um, but otherwise, I think what you could do is you could start like adding even more detail to this resume. Let it turn into two pages. But when you get ready to actually go apply for a specific internship, figure out which of these projects are most important. Maybe keep the top three that you think are going to be most important, most relevant to that company. Keep those three on the page. And then like just leave more room down here at the bottom for like that relevant work experience. And then over here on the left side, you're just gonna keep University of Waterloo, um, you know, when you're expected to graduate and things like that. And then just other work experience. Um, and then for your contact info up here at the top, just cause you've masked it out, uh, make sure you've got GitHub, LinkedIn, phone number and email address on there. But I'm, I'm guessing that you already had that on there. You just masked it out, which is fine. Um, so let's see from there. Yeah, I would, I would put the extracurricular under your education. So there's a, there's a newspaper term. A newspaper is like how we used to print the news. Um, but when you think about it, by the time they published the news, printed on paper, 
get those newspapers out to the store for you to buy. It was really like yesterday. So why is it called news? It's not new anymore. It's old. Um, that's my dad joke for the day. The um, but there's a there's a term in newspaper uh, land called above the fold. And when you think about how when you think about how a newspaper is actually folded up, right? You've got your headline and everything on here, and then they fold up this part here and they stack it this way. The most important eye-catching stuff is in the top half of that page and everything else is is kind of underneath that fold mark and so they call this top part above the fold and it's a term that uh, we actually use in advertising uh, as well in ad tech where if you can put an ad sort of above the fold which is like the first chunk of the of what the browser is rendering before the user has to scroll down to see more everything within the initial browser window pane is what they call above the fold and that's prime advertising real estate it's the same thing with your resume i would say cut the resume in half like cut it in half like right here at your oops wrong uh, wrong thing to highlight um cut it in half right here at the teaching assistant everything above this point should be like the most important relevant stuff that i need to see about you in a hurry because even though I'm kind of scanning over this stuff, I'm scanning slowly to begin with, but by the time I get to the bottom of the page, I'm actually scanning much faster. Um, and so, and, and we, we didn't really talk about that when we were on the call with Josh last Thursday, uh, kind of hearing the HR and engineering perspectives on resumes. But that is the reality is that we're not, we're not re like even though it's a quick scan of like five, 10 seconds, it's not constant velocity down the page. It starts out slow and it accelerates over the page. And so, like the most relevant stuff where you say, I have the skills that you're looking for, that needs to be at the top of the page. The projects that really highlight the skills that I'm looking for has to be in the top half of the page. Uh, your education, because it's an internship and that extracurricular Google hash code thing, get that on the top half of that page. It's not that the stuff under that is not important. It's just, I'm not gonna see it. I'm just not gonna see it as much. I'm not gonna pick up as much detail unless you start throwing like a little bit of bold or something in there, but don't throw bold on every keyword. Um, I, I usually tell people like use bold like hot sauce, right? If you just dump tons of hot sauce, hot sauce on, on your food, it just, it loses its value. But if you sprinkle a little bit on, now it's like, oh, cool, there's something extra. Um, and so think think about it that way. Um, I think that it'll, it'll just make it uh, a little bit easier for you to sort of manage that. Um, and hey, with those last couple of follows, I have ticked over my eight bit uh, user count. So, yay, I'm into my ninth bit of followers, hooray. Um, I have 257 followers now. Cool, um, so just catching up on chat here. Just listening in the background, we're getting your kid ready for bed, cool. Um, just kind of catching up, they have specific intern roles. Let me scroll back up. Um, from Samsara, it's a computer software company, okay. So, I mean, depending on what they do, right? Because, I mean, they're, hundreds and thousands of software companies, but they're all going to be doing slightly different things. So depending on the skills that they're looking for, depending on what the company does, like what's what's the product of the company? What do they build? Is it consulting software? Like are they just, are you like staff augmentation to like help other people build software or do they work on a software product of some kind and you're part of that team? If so, what is that product? And are any of these projects even remotely related to what they do? or do they do something similar to what their thing may do? That's the project that you wanna promote immediately under your skills. Like whatever looks the most relevant to them needs to be the very first project that you list. Not necessarily the one that you're most proud of, but the one that's the most relevant to them. Because again, the resume is a list of facts about what you bring to the company and how you're gonna help the company. Even though it's an internship role, you're still bringing something to the team. And so you really need to sell them on like, what are you bringing to the team? Uh, would I do projects before work experience? In this case, yes, because you're, uh, uh, Extreme Dudes only experiences internships. If you actually get out in the workplace and you have like a full-time development role, now you can start taking projects off your resume and you're gonna list that work experience first and then you'll list um, like any other projects that are still relevant to the company while you're still new in the industry. Once you get like two or three years experience, you won't have projects on your resume at all. Usually like, unless there's like one project where you're like, hey, like I continue to maintain this on the side and this is super relevant to your company. And so I wanna make sure that you see this. Then yeah, you wanna put that on the resume. Otherwise, like 
they've got a link to your GitHub. If they're curious about your projects, they'll go look. Um, or if you talk about it in a cover letter, they may go look. But uh, but otherwise, you can just leave leave the projects off the resume once you get a couple of years of experience. Um, so projects on the left side? No, I would keep the projects on the right side. So um, on the left side. So this is how I would or this is how I would tell you to do it. But again, you don't have to follow my advice. This is just my advice. There there are other people in chat that are happy to drop advice too. So extreme dude, here's my advice: uh, keep your education up here at the top. Next, right under your education, move this extracurricular thing underneath your education. From there, I would rename this to just be other experience. And then over here on this side, um, so you've got languages and you got Raspberry Pi and then more languages and then a language. JavaScript should have a capital S. Uh, LaTeX databases is kind of vague, like what database? So you've done SQL, so it's probably going to be a relational database, but like, is it MySQL? Is it Postgres? Is it MS SQL? Like, as a company, I may not care. I mean, honestly, you're an intern. Your exposure is probably this much anyway, unless you've done something really cool with SQL. Um, it's probably like, it's probably not going to matter that much. But if I'm, if my job host is looking for MySQL and you've used MySQL, put MySQL on here. Don't just say databases. Um, and if you've used like MongoDB and like NoSQL databases, like list those as well. Um, and then I would start with the projects, but at most I would keep three projects and I would reduce the text in here a little bit. I like that you're starting, uh, oops, sorry, let me go back. You actually made those real links. Um, Discord bot, like you're, you're giving me a lot of information about what this bot is doing. If that's really relevant to, again, what they do as a company, then you could leave that explanation. Otherwise, I think you could reduce some of these explanations a tiny bit. Generally, what I advise here, the first bullet point should be some kind of user statement. Um, like you've written out, like this is a Discord bot to give users blah, 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 or I've developed an application that gives the user a grid in which blah. Well, take off, like I'm, I'm just looking at your Pathfinder here. Take off these first words. Like you don't need these words at all. Yeah, of course you developed an application. You made a thing and you put it on your resume. So those words are redundant. You can just say, user sees a grid to place nodes to find the shortest path. Or users can find shortest, shortest route between two nodes. That's your user statement. It shows a lot more empathy for you as a developer if you write that out as what the user does with that application as opposed to, um, like I, I usually think about it like an elevator pitch. Like if you, if you got on an elevator with a VC funding person and you were, gonna, you were about to ask them for 250K to like seed round you know, a startup around this project, you'd be like, you won't believe this thing that I built using Riot API and the Twitch API where I'm like pulling up to date information about uh, you know, gaming ranks and whatever. They're like, ding, the elevator's open, they're gone, right? But if you say like, hey, users can interact with, uh, you know, some APIs that I wrote to give real-time statistics about a user's activity, they'd be like, okay, cool, here's your, here's your money, right? And so you have to write that as a user empathy statement as like, what, is the, what does the user do with this app? Tell me, like, I'm the user, I'm using this app, what should I expect to do? What is this for? Why am I here? Why am I going to go look at this project? So it comes down to that user statement. That would be the first bullet point is just user can blah, blah, blah. Like tell me what the user is going to do. From there, I would tell me one cool thing that you learned while building that project. And then the third bullet point is just your tech stack. So I think you could reduce this a little bit. Also, depending on the on the uh, tool that you use to build this out, see if you can bring this the actual bullet icons, see if you can bring that over here to the left edge because you've got like this quarter inch of unused empty space. And so see if you can move the bullet point over to the left a little bit so that the bullet point is lined up with the G in GitHub. And then like that'll also give you a little bit more room. And then as well, if you kind of shrink that left column, then the right column will be a little bigger a little bit bigger so you can get a little bit more text in there so that these things maybe aren't wrapping onto multiple lines. Use SQL Alchemy. Uh, well, I mean, SQL Alchemy is an ORM, but like, what was the database under that? Was it Postgres? Was it MySQL? Like, put SQL Alchemy on there. Like, that's that could be a skill um, that they're looking for. Um, but ultimately, SQL Alchemy is talking to some kind of database. So what kind of database was it? Um, now, my caution there is if you put Postgres on there, but that's all you did was just you interacted with a table that already existed, 
then you're maybe misrepresenting a little bit like, oh yeah, I know all about Postgres. And they're like, oh, well, how do you do this or that in Postgres? And you're like, I don't know, I just made a table to put data in. Um, and so you do need to be a little bit careful about putting skills on here that, that are gonna misrepresent what you actually know. But you could put SQL Alchemy and just in parentheses put like Postgres or MySQL. So that lets them know that, you know, SQL Alchemy, it happened to be on top of Postgres. And so in the interview, you can say like, yeah, I built this thing using SQL Alchemy the database under the hood was MySQL or Postgres, but I don't know very much about the low level database side of things. I just knew how to make the tables and, and so on. That's fine, you're an intern. They don't expect you to know all the things, but they do expect that what you have on the resume, you can explain, but they don't need you to know everything. Cool, so that would be my, uh, my like, what, 10, 15 minute blurb on uh, some thoughts around here. Uh, sorting algorithm visualizers, cool. So when I uh, when I taught when I taught software development, I would send my students over to YouTube and uh, watch like the Hungarian dancers do the sorting algorithms, where they're like dancing around. They have like a number on a, on a jersey or something, and they're like dancing around, spinning around together, and then figuring out like how to do the swaps. And they were doing like uh, bubble sort and insertion sort and merge sort and you know a handful of others, and they were just doing them in these dances which are fine, but I always told my students like, hey, like load up the video, but then after about five seconds, you can mute the audio because some of the music like gets really repetitive and kind of sticks in your head for a while, so. Cool, so hopefully that'll help you out. Um, Trash Dev is also suggesting open source contributions, which I think is, is good. Um, is there anything wrong with white space? No, there's nothing wrong with empty white space, but the fact that you've got this big chunk down here that's not being used, um, again, I think you could just reorganize some of this stuff a little bit because like your bookkeeping job, while chronologically, it's kind of important to see the, chrono the chronology of when you've done things, it's not technical compared to everything else that you've done here. And so like the bookkeeping job would be like your other experience um, where what I would want to see on here is like your internship and the fact that you taught, you know, algorithm classes and things like that. So that's why I would move those things over to the right side. Just again, so the, the really relevant stuff about you is taking up the, the space on the right side. So yeah, if you need to reduce the amount of projects because you've got an internship role, you've got that teaching experience. But again, I don't think you have to give them like the class name. Just say I taught, you know, key concepts like intro to programming, algorithms, system programming, like just do a comma limited list or, or a comma uh, list of of the classes you don't have to give them the class code and whatever they're not going to go look it up i promise you i would never go like oh let me go verify comp 2560 is actually a system programming class and this person was actually listed as a as a teacher they're not going to do that they're mostly going to take your word for it if you got it on a resume there is there is some amount of trust that they're going to give you on this now they may ask during the interview like hey tell me like what kinds of things were you teaching in that comp architecture which you spelled wrong um, they may say like, tell me what you were actually teaching in that architecture class. Um, so yeah, also double check for spelling. Cool. Uh, no need to own my baggage. <laughs> You're a coder first and accountant second. Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing that I, I told a lot of students, uh, when I, I taught at a code school here in, in Denver called Turing School of Software and Design, and we would get job changers all the time, like total career changers. And they'd be like, yeah, I got like 10 years of experience and all this stuff. I'm like, great, you're not that person anymore. You are now a software developer who happens to know bookkeeping. Um, and so you need to really downplay that because I've seen a lot of resumes where they're like, here's all this stuff about bookkeeping and you know, the little skills block off in the bottom left corners. Like I happen to know like Ruby. It's like, okay, well, that's not a programmer's resume. Um, and we actually, uh, one of the resumes that we looked at with Josh on Thursday was a little bit like that. Uh, the person had a hardware background. Let me go see if I can find it real quick. I'll just pull it up. The person had a uh, um, a background in like hardware development in medical devices. Um, no, I think I I think I deleted them off my local drive. Um, but they were currently going to a computer science program, and so they had like a skills block saying programming, but their entire like page and a half resume was all hardware experience. And, and it was really hard for Josh and I both, like we were looking over for like a minute and a half before we realized like, oh, they're a computer science student. 
they're still in university, but they didn't list any project work and all their work experience was all hardware. It's like, okay, well, you're, you're, you're presenting a hardware resume. If you want to be a software developer, you need to reduce all this hardware stuff and just say, I've been in the hardware industry for 10, 15 years, but I'm getting into software now. I want to visit the other side of this. These are the software projects that I've worked on, and this is how I'm utilizing the skills that I'm learning in university as I apply for internship roles. That's a totally different kind of resume. Um, so yeah, keeping, keeping those things in mind are, are pretty important. Um, yeah, it looks like I don't have... Uh... Oh, no, I do have them. See if I can find it real quick. I'm not sure which one it is. I'll see if I can find it real quick. Cool. If you got other questions in chat, feel free to drop those in chat while I'm browsing for this resume. I suppose I could have just looked at the list of. Yeah, here it is. Resume number seven. So this was the hardware developer resume that we got, and. You know, so we kind of scan and we're like, okay, well, you know, you got a professional summary in here, but it's kind of long and we mostly skipped it. And then we're looking through like, okay, hardware, 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 hardware. But they, you know, they, they say up here that they know all these skills and they're into C++ and Python, but none of this is, is like programming experience at all. And then we're looking at it going, what the heck? And they're like, oh, they're a computer science student over here on the right side, graduating in 2022. And the very last sentence up here is that I'm completing my bachelor's degree in computer science. And so our advice was like, dude, like write us a software resume. Like this is a great hardware resume if you're applying for a hardware job. Um, but this doesn't read as a software developer resume. And so like just understanding like who's going to be reading it and what they're like, the kinds of things that they're going to be looking for can make a big difference in, in how you shape what, what's on the page. Cool. Trash Desk says my resume is due to... And, and probably half lies, right, Trash? <laughs> Just by what you're going, you know, telling us on your streams, like, oh yeah, I totally lied, made all this stuff up. Just kidding. Just like giving you a hard time. I don't even know you in person. I'm going to give you a hard time. Um, Dota says, do we need to talk about stuff like this? Um, I mean, talking about like, you know, you're not you're not a bookkeeper anymore, extreme dude. Like that is part of your background and that is experience that you're bringing. And that could get you, you know, your foot in the door um, when we think about, um, like, what kind of job do you want to get? Do you want to go get a job in fintech? If you've got a bookkeeping background, that's less that I have to teach you about bookkeeping and why bookkeeping is important and bookkeeping principles and things like that that are part of the application that you're going to work on. Now I can skip like a week of onboarding because I don't have to teach you why that stuff is important. And so from a company perspective, that could be really relevant. But we could also like like thinking back to how you had like um, all that other experience which is actually relevant work experience and the the less relevant was the bookkeeping if you're applying for a job that is not in bookkeeping take it off the resume like yeah chronologically it's cool to see like the order that things happened but again if you need room on the page and that's less relevant to my company don't put it on the page that's how we whittle everything down to one page. You only show me what's relevant. Like right now in my own job hunt, I was, I was talking about this at the beginning of the stream. I'm applying for developer relations jobs. Well, I've got 25 years as an individual contributor, as a manager, as a team lead, as a director. It's like, how relevant is that if I'm gonna get into a, a developer relations role? I mean, more of the programming is gonna be more important than you know, the fact that I was a director of engineering. Um, not to say that being a director of engineering wasn't important, but it lets them know like, hey, if you need me to step up and lead the team, like if, if whoever is currently managing the team needs to like step away for a vacation or something, I could fill that role. Um, then they know that about me, but I don't need to, you know, give them like 10 bullet points on what I did as a director of engineering. I can just list it on there or I can just leave it off. Actually, on my resume for the longest time, I had a little line on there saying like, um, you know, this is just a summary of my work experience relevant to this role for my full work history, go see my LinkedIn and I actually linked my LinkedIn profile. So they could actually go see like all the stuff I've been involved in, all the different startups I've been a part of, the things that I've done, the impact that I had at those jobs. If they really care, they'll go look at it on LinkedIn. Um, otherwise, I'm only putting the most relevant stuff onto that one page. And so my one page resume right now for developer relations is talking about my content creation, my technical writing, the um, 
uh, like the tech interview website and the daily email series that I'm doing and, and you know, how I come up with uh, like accessible, inclusive kind of content, um, how I'm doing like live streaming, I'm doing YouTube, I'm doing podcasts. Like I, I talk about all that kind of stuff because that's the important stuff for developer relations. You know, and the fact that I code, you know, I've certainly got background in coding. And so I list the, the, the languages and the frameworks that I, I want to work in the most um, or that are the most relevant to, to their company. I certainly list that on there, but I'm not, I'm not going to give them a three page resume of my entire background because most of it's not going to be relevant for this next role that I want to get. Cool. All right. Let's uh, catch up on chat here a little bit. Um, used to BS super hard in interviews back in the day. Yeah. I doubt the bookkeeping would be a detractor. No, it won't be a detractor at all. Um, it's just, it's not who you are. And so you don't want to give it prominence at the top of the page, just list it down at the bottom. Like this is also experience that I have. Um, but if you need the room, take it off. You can talk about it in the cover letter and say, I have a bit of a bookkeeping background, but now I'm a software developer and this is where I want to take my career. Um, just notice the dragon being printed. Yeah, so I'm doing it in this really cool marble um, filament. Let me see if I can get a uh, photo of it. Let me, uh, let me go back and share my uh, my browser over here. So this is the marble filament. It's a really nice light white with these black flecks in it. Um, it, it looks really, really amazing. It's pretty, pretty sweet for sure. So yeah, I have a lot of fun printing these dragons. These are, uh, these are pretty great. So yeah, that's that's what I got going on on uh, on this printer that you can see over my over my left shoulder here. Um, and then yeah, I just I popped uh, little Raspberry Pis and webcams on on all the printers, and so I can actually just pull that up, partly to give me like oh yeah, you know, it's like oh no, it jammed and it's not working. I can go stop it, or or I can look at it and go hey, look at this thing I'm printing. You know, eventually I'd love to do uh, I'd love to do more regular giveaways. I think that, that was pretty fun Thursday night doing the uh, doing the giveaways and playing Oprah with you get a dragon you get a dragon oh that was pretty fun too the NASA pen that writes upside down so my first job out of college actually got one of those NASA pens I don't know if it ever wrote upside down um, but they were they were very very overpriced for sure Chris Jarvis whoa yeah the uh, the dragon model was actually pretty inexpensive I want to say it was only like four bucks for the model it was it was pretty inexpensive for the quality of what it is and uh, so these dragons that I'm printing right now, they're about two feet long, uh, all stretched out. They're just, they're coiled up on the, on the print bed in order to fit. And so they print kind of in a coil and they print flat and you just pick it up and, and it basically 3D prints the hinges in place. And then by the time it like starts uh, doing the top layers, that hinge is completely enclosed. And so this won't come apart unless you break it. Like you could like twist it and snap it and it would break apart. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, all the hinges are, are completely attached. And this is kind of a burgundy silver. Well, it was supposed to be burgundy and silver, but the silver actually turned out kind of a light lavender color, uh, which is pretty cool. Just the, uh, the randomness of where the color started and stopped. It started on the burgundy and did a kind of a racing stripe down the side and then went back to burgundy. And then uh, uh, let's see what else. Although I've got just the marble one uh, printing now. Um, but yeah, all these are going up to Canada for uh, family, so. Trash tag got the charcoal one, gonna add it in your, in your background, sweet. Yeah, so I'm gonna get those mailed out tomorrow. Um, so if you're on the stream and you won one of those dragons on Thursday, if you haven't sent me your address, Trash Tab, I know you have, um, send me your address, because I wanna send these out tomorrow. Uh, the longer it takes you to get me your address, the longer it's gonna delay getting there, and I'm gonna start harassing you on Twitch um, or and or other platforms if we're connected on other platforms. Uh, funny enough, some of the smaller Twitch communities are more enjoyable. <laughs> well, I hope you find mine enjoyable. Um, I mean, I don't typically get too many viewers uh, in the evening. Uh, most of my views actually happen on YouTube after the fact, uh, which is fine. But I love interacting with chat, and so I love when people drop by. So I appreciate all of you coming by and, and hanging out with me. Um, but I'm going to start doing uh, more live coding. As I mentioned earlier in the stream, I'm going to do more stuff during the day uh, since I'm fun employed now. Um, as I kind of study up for these last interviews and so on. Um, and for the Amazon one, I'm gonna start the Amazon like cloud practitioner, whatever the first like entry level one is. Um, I'm gonna start going through that curriculum this week. And because I've got my Amazon interview on Friday 
And so when they get around to be like, hey, tell us about a time you took initiative, I'm like, yeah, I need this cert. So I've got the date set, it's in January, whatever. And I'm actually working through the curriculum right now so that I'm set to go. If I get this job, you know, I'm already part of the way there. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, would it, oh, where would I add open source pull requests on the resume? Well, is it just a pull request or did it get merged? Um, Cause that's, that's different because I could contribute code. Like uh, a year ago, October, for like Hacktoberfest, um, companies are like, hey, just go do a pull request on, on a repo and we're gonna like count them up and like win prizes and whatever. And people were just putting trash pull requests in of like, hey, you missed a comma in your documentation. Hey, look at me, I made a pull request. Um, and so it, it actually really decreased what a lot of the community found value in making pull requests because people were literally just spamming pull requests to, just to try to win these prizes. So they changed it up for this year, and I, I think they did a better job of it this year. Um, but if it's just a pull request versus it actually got merged and it's part of the code, it's a little different. Like, what kind of feedback did you get? Did you act on that feedback? Did you improve it? Or is it still just sitting as a PR? Um, me, myself, I actually don't put open source uh, like contributions on my resume anymore. If they're curious about it, they can go look at my GitHub and see like the different things that I contribute to. Um, I don't specifically call them out on my on my resume right now. Um, I would probably put them on sites like Polywork and put them on LinkedIn, but I probably wouldn't put it on, on a resume. Um, I don't know that it's going to be that relevant. Again, it depends how relevant that code base is to the company. Like if it was Facebook who makes React and you make a pull request to React, then yeah, you want that to be really prominent. Like, hey, I'm contributing, you know, I'm a contributor to the, to the project. Um, then yeah, you would absolutely call that out. But if it's something where, you know, you're contributing to, you know, this open source snowflake pattern, it's like, don't care. Most companies aren't going to care. Um, and so it really depends on the open source software that's OSS. Um, I linked to a GitHub that had pull requests. Oh, it was merged. Oh, so it did get merged in. So yeah, I mean, if it got merged into Rails, then heck yeah, you're a Rails contributor. Um, I mean, no matter the size of, of, the, uh, of the pull request, you contributed to Rails. Well, I don't know, is Rails dev part of Rails or is it just like the platform that talks about Rails? I might need some clarification on that, but I don't feel as though it was a major item, but it was merged without any unreadiness. Okay. I mean, if they merged it in, great. Um, if you're known in the community, it helps a ton. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a guy that I follow on LinkedIn. Uh, his name is Taylor Dessen. I think it's D-E-S-S-Y-N. He's a recruiter. And normally I hate recruiters. I hate agency recruiters. Um, but Taylor actually live streams on LinkedIn every morning, Monday to Friday. And he's actually got some good things to say. I actually really respect his opinion on things because he's he's also in the same camp of, as me of like tech interviews suck. They need to change. Companies need to change their perspectives on things. Um, and he he's constantly interviewing people on his stream too. Um, like almost every day he's got someone on his stream talking about something. Um, and he was talking to someone last week and, and they were kind of bouncing this idea back and forth of like, how do you, like, how do you really stand out? And the person that he was interviewing made a, made a comment or made, said something to the effect of like, you need to be discoverable. Like if you do something where people can discover you, that's almost as powerful, if not more powerful than like the networking and you know somebody at the company. Like if somebody at the company is like, I'm looking for a React expert and like my name shows up, it won't. But if my name shows up, they're like, let's call Ian, see if Ian wants his job. You know, we're looking for a React expert and you showed up in the search result. Um, that's a lot, that's a lot better place to be than just, hi, I'm Ian, I've got React skills, please hire me. Um, if they find you, that's way better. So back in October, I'd have to go back and look at the date. I had someone on the stream named Jen. Jen's an amazing developer and uh, she's been in the industry for a year and a half, two years maybe. Um, if I remember right, I hope I got that right. Um, she was looking for a job change, did a whole bunch of like apply now, apply now, apply through LinkedIn, you know, just massive, like hundreds of applications, got zero phone calls, made a profile on workforastartup.com and AngelList, which is angel.co, had 15 companies find her through those websites. She didn't actively promote it. She was still like trying to apply, you know, everywhere else. But these 15 companies found her through those two websites, those turned into a series of interviews and she had seven job offers at the end of it.
because she was discoverable. She got found through these platforms. And so you can go watch that on YouTube if you want. Um, there's my YouTube channel. Um, you can go check that out. Uh, her name is Jen Batara and she was fantastic. Just to kind of hear that story of like, how did she even juggle that many interviews when she was also working full time? How did she juggle so many interviews with so many companies and how did she time it all to get all of the offers all at the same time? Like she, like it wasn't like, oh, she got one offer and then a month later she got another offer. She had all seven offers at the same time. And that blew my mind. I'm like, how? Like I'm, I'm trying to interview with three companies right now and it feels like a lot to juggle while I'm still trying to figure out should I interview somewhere else? Um, because I'm really hoping uh, one of these three is going to pan out, but we'll see. We'll see how it, how it plays out this week. Um, so it wasn't Rails, it was Rails Dev. Okay, someone's making a site for people to hire developers. Oh, sweet. You're familiar with Taylor? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, you're still contributing to the Rails community. So um, that might be something I put in a cover letter, maybe not on a resume. Um, especially if it wasn't like a major thing. Like I added the authentication system on railsdev.com or something like that. Like um, if it's not like a really big feature that like everyone's going to notice and like, oh, look at this thing that got built. And that was Hitokiri. Um, it's not that it's not important. It's not that your contribution wasn't important. It got merged in. So clearly it was needed. Um, I just don't know if it would belong on a resume. I might talk about it in a in a cover letter or if you get on a on a call and say, tell me about yourself. Just say, yeah, I'm part of, part of the community. I like working on open source. I had some code merged in for this Rails uh, job platform called railsdev.com. Uh, I contributed to their open source and I got merged in. That made me feel pretty good. Like you can talk about that as part of who you are and what you are going to bring to the company. Um, like anything you can do to kind of like spin that a little bit. Um, all right, Dota, you got to take off. Good to see you. Um, cool. Yeah, well, I've been at this for two hours now, so I might uh, I might take off pretty soon too. I got uh, I got to do up the address labels for those boxes, and then I'm gonna get that to the post office first thing tomorrow. Uh, so Chris, hopefully you'll get your uh, you'll get your dragon in a couple of days, depending on how fast uh, U USPS can uh, get that out to California. But uh, we'll get that out to you soon. Um, and anybody else that's on the call or on the stream that uh, that won a dragon, if you have not sent me your address, send me your address right away. So I want to get these things sent out. Um, so I don't want to delay it too much because of holidays. And then, uh, yeah, the, the Marble Dragon that's printing right now and, and some of the other ones, uh, they're, they're going up north to family. Uh, so my family is like, well, I don't really want one, but like this guy that I do work for, like he would like one. It's like, all right. Oh, and the other thing that I've printed, um, so that color changing filament, I made this cup for my niece and it's called a rain cup. Uh, so Trash Dev, you might get a kick out of this. So like when your kids play in the back bathtub, they can like scoop up the water and it just drips out of uh, the bottom and they call it a rain cup. Um, and so I made it with the, uh, with the color changing filament. So in theory, while she's, uh, pulling warm water out of the tub and doing stuff with it, that it'll start to change color. So you can see it's starting to change color a little bit. I'm just holding it up against the heater there. And then when it gets really hot, it'll be like a bright, bright yellow. Um, so yeah. So I thought that would be kind of fun for her to, uh, to kind of play with in the tub. Um, and it'll be water sealable uh, enough that it's not going to like get moldy or anything like that. But I mean, if it gets soap and stuff in here, it might get a little gross, but they can just wash it out by hand. So yeah, it'll be pretty fun to, uh, to get all this stuff mailed up. I got a ton of boxes to go up to Canada too. Um, so yeah, so hopefully my job hunt stuff goes well this week. There you can kind of see the bright yellow. I held it right up against the heater. Well, you can't really because of the lights. You kind of see it that way but yeah it gets really bright yellow when it's hot um so that'll be kind of fun you know it may also let my sister know when the water in the tub is too warm um if uh you know if, if they put it in and it turns yellow it might be too hot for the baby but you can see even just me holding it with my with my hands that just the heat from my fingers is, is changing the color a little bit too so that'll be kind of fun um so yeah, what do I got going on this week? I got a system design interview, supposed to be on Tuesday. I got a follow-up call with Amazon on Tuesday for my prep. I'm hoping to hear back from Twilio soon. I did the interview with them on Friday, did another interview with another company. I really want their job. Hopefully they're gonna get back to me tomorrow or Tuesday, hopefully. I really, really, really hope. Uh, that's the job I want the most. Um, interviewing IO, I think I'm doing the system design. They said Tuesday, but I haven't seen like anything show up on my calendar yet. Um, and then I got a handful of startups that have reached out. And then I, I went through and I applied for like 
nine or ten more jobs today. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a busy week, but it's not like I got anything else to do. So while I'm prepping for all of those, I'm going to live stream more during the day. Um, Trash Dev, what time do you normally stream? Are you going to be streaming this week? Because I don't want to conflict with your stream during the daytime. I want to say you normally stream around like 2 p.m. Pacific. So we'll see uh, see if I can stream like when you're not streaming because I want to be able to support your stream and, and so on. Um, oh, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. ish. Okay. Oh, just somewhere in that range. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll probably I'll probably be on on the stream at some point, like a little bit every day, probably all this week. Um, yeah, I looked at like the next partner level on Twitch, and you got to stream for like 25 hours over 30 days. And it's got to be on 12 different days, but you have to have like 75 average viewers like the whole time. I'm like, yeah, I got like seven viewers right now. So that's not that's not happening anytime soon. Uh, but that's fine. It's not like I'm in this to, to make the money anyway. Um, and just just for giggles, I, I made a merch store so you can go buy some tech interview guide merch. I made like T-shirts and hoodies um, and I make like three dollars on a T-shirt or something ridiculous. But uh, yeah, go check out my merch link. You can buy my merch. Um, I actually ordered a bunch of it myself. One of them is a desk mat, and it's got the logo on it. So I'm looking forward to actually getting that in, getting some T-shirts with my logo on it. And it's just, it's just this logo. It's just a Comfort AA font or something like that. It's nothing special made at all. I did it on Wix in like 10 minutes. But uh, it'll be fun to have a, a T-shirt with the logo on it. But yeah, if you want to support the channel, go buy my merch. <laughs> I feel dumb even saying that. Like, I'm so not good at marketing anything I do. But anyway. Um, cool. Yeah, partner's hard on Twitch for sure. But uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not doing this to make money. I'm just doing this to help people out and, and uh, help help community as much as I can. So yeah, I think I'm going to take off. My voice is uh, feeling a little raw. Have a great week, everybody. Um, let's see. Who can we go raid? It's got to be somebody we can raid. Chris Perillo's online. Uh, got some music people online. I don't know. Trash Dev, you got anybody you like to raid that happens to be online right now? If not, I'm going to send everybody over to uh, this guy, Calvin Thomas. He does live music. He's he's pretty entertaining to watch. He's actually a pretty good singer, pretty good musician. Um, I've been really into just having music on in the background uh, while I'm coding. So we'll uh, we'll go raid this guy, I think. Cool, so we'll go do that. Um, so have a great week, everybody. I'll be back on Thursday. Um, I will be nervous. Thursday night because Friday is my Amazon interview. Hopefully by then I get a like next step with these other companies. And if I can get through some of those, maybe have a job offer by by then. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Maybe oh, I should live stream my negotiations. That would be an interesting live stream. Like I'm on a live call right now negotiating my salary. Come come listen in. Um, that would be oh, that would be an interesting thing. I've I've also thought about how interesting it would be to actually live stream actually being in a tech interview. Like I'm, I'm literally in a tech interview right now. Come watch my stream. Watch me fumble through, but watch my process. That would be that would be a really interesting stream thing to kind of sit through. Not just like, oh, here I am grinding on Leetco, but like actually being in a real interview. Um, I wonder, I wonder how many companies would like freak out about that. <laughs> probably, probably many of them. But that would be that would be kind of fun too. Well, I don't think there's anything illegal about a trash dev. I think just companies like as soon as they know that you've effectively published their interview problem online, they have to go through and change the question because they don't want uh, they don't want other people to uh, to like sort of game the system by knowing that problem. Um, and I've been in that position as a hiring manager where like the questions we asked got leaked. And some companies will actually make you sign a non-disclosure that you won't talk about the actual problem. And those are legally binding if you sign it. And they usually won't do the interview if you don't sign it. Anyway. <laughs>